any questions? Start agenda item 13. So that's the update and discussion of possible action recommendations regarding children's vision legislative proposal. I'll have Joanne give a quick update, then I'll ask for comments from the uh, the work group from Dr. Calgucci and from Rachel. So update since the last board meeting, there was a children's vision work group and then a leg reg meeting that had the discussion of children's vision. Um, the children's vision work group brought back brought together a wide group of interested parties. Um, it was a very productive meeting, hearing from the various stakeholders about how to approach this item. The, the consensus is that we, everyone wants to have children have their vision tested, have be able to have access to this. It's the how doing it is the problem and the discussion points. Um, so with the, with the children's vision work group, there is I think about 25 people that participated. And then at the ledge reg committee, there are other participants that are able to add on that weren't at the ledge, uh, weren't at the work group meeting. Um, from there, you'll see in the attachment, which uh, the board members will go over, but that is what uh, the work group has come up with as a concept. And I'll turn it over to them. So, <clears throat> what we try to do is be very thoughtful of those interested parties in our meetings that we've had over time. The last meeting was on September the 22nd. <clears throat> and um, we put together, we, just, we received all the feedback from these interested parties um, to come up with the children's vision ledge proposal that you have in your attachment there. And in the past, let me back up a little bit. In the past, we've um, received unanimous support from the board to pursue legislation to address the opportunity that we believe exists with children's vision in the state of California. And um, we're gonna be seeking your support again. If there's any questions that you have, um, I know that there's some new board members. Um, I don't wanna to have to go through all the, the statistics and things like that, but if there are any specific questions around um, the, the basis behind this, I can definitely answer those, so can Rachel. Do any of the new board members want to say kind of a brief, maybe not the whole thing, but anyone? This is basically for uh, Dr. McIntyre, uh, for Ruby, for Maria, I think everyone else kind of heard that. Anything else? Did you have, what was the question? Do you, want, do you, want, to do you want a little bit of information? Do you want a little bit more information, more information from Dr. Yeah. Calvary yeah. or Rachel? Yeah. Yeah. Like background on it, just to kind of okay. actually. That would be wonderful okay. since I if you want. jumped into this sure. mid-year here. <laughs> so um, I'll just, so I had my first optometry board meeting. I was a newbie. Mm -hmm. I had a six-year-old at the time who couldn't, was having trouble reading. And I just asked, why isn't it required for children to have comprehensive eye exams before they start school? Just like they go see a dentist or a pediatrician, anything like that. And I was told that that they've tried it, it's never happened, it's never gotten through. So I said, well, let's, let's change that. And so I found my comrade in arms there, Dr. Kalguchi, and he and I have been working on this issue for now almost over two Jeez. years. Um, last time we went to uh, Senator Holly Mitchell and talked with her. Uh, there actually previously was a bill, I think it was Senator Rod Wright had carried something similar. He got in a little hot water. So he was no longer in the Senate, <laughs> so um, it died. Uh, so we talked with Senator Mitchell. Uh, she was gracious enough to author the bill. Uh, we went through both Senate uh, Health Committee and Senate Education Committee. It went through both of those committees without one single no vote in policy, and then it went to Senate Appropriations Committee where it died. It, didn't, it never even got heard for a, yeah. So, what was great about that process, though, was we were able to identify who's in opposition. We were able to create that dialogue, then came up with the idea that, you know, I'm a big believer in bringing everyone around the table, making sure everyone's voice is heard, and we started the Children's Vision um, Coalition. 
and we worked very hard. I think that list was pretty comprehensive, all kinds of different groups. We invited from all over the state of California to participate. Um, and we've had three meetings, um, some really good information. Uh, we've worked through some of the issues. Um, and then this is a product of that. Uh, is this exactly what will be introduced? Probably not, because as we know, you have to have the ability to negotiate as a bill goes through the process. But the, the gist of what we're trying to do is make sure that parents especially are aware that it's important to have a comprehensive eye exam for your child. Number two, we want to provide a resource to, to school nurses because you know they're inundated now between vaccinations and everything else. And so this way, what we're hoping is in partnership with school nurses, this is a form, it's not mandatory. A parent can sign off and say they've chosen not to do a comprehensive eye, eye exam and instead they will get the usual vision screening that's already in state statute. But if I'm a school nurse and I see, oh, McKenna Michelin got a comprehensive eye exam, then I can kind of put her over here and focus on some of the kids that may not have had a comprehensive eye exam. Also, we're hoping that it becomes a resource if a child's acting up in school or having problems reading. The school nurse can then pull the sheet and realize, oh, she's not had a comprehensive eye exam. I'm going to reach out to the parents and encourage them to do that. Thirdly, um, which I thought Dr. Taraguchi added that's important, is also making that information available to the teachers. Because currently, the teachers don't necessarily get the information. So that way, a teacher is with that child more often than a school nurse or an administrator. They'll, be, they'll know McKenna needs to wear glasses. So when she's not wearing her glasses, the teacher can quietly say, hey, wear your glasses. You need to put them on. Because you know, especially when they're little, um, they may not wear them. So that's kind of how we got to this point. Um, we would like to reintroduce the bill, um, bringing in this coalition now that we've built to see if we can continue down this path and, and get this put into law. I have a question for you. If you could just give me a comment on some of the uh, maybe obstacles you've endured so they can have a little feedback. Oh, sure. So um, the biggest opposition to the bill is Kaiser. They opposed it. Um, we were also received opposition from um, the school nurses and the American Academy of Pediatrics and the eye, eye physicians. So it, it's really an issue. I mean, it's kind of hard. I mean, let's just be blunt. It's medical and optometry kind of colliding. Uh, but I think we've worked through some of those issues. I mean, I think we're, we've worked very hard with the school nurses to try to, to get them on board. Um, we, when we did these work groups, we invited every single person who opposed the bill to join us. Um, school nurses were always there. Uh, Kaiser chose not to participate. So we'll see what, what they do going forward. Uh, but that was, and then the other issue why it failed in Senate approach was because of the cost that the committee put on the eye exam. And so we've worked on that data and collecting the data on, particularly when it comes to Medicare, Medi-Cal reimbursement rates. Um, we also have initiatives on the ballot that could make a difference in terms of if some of them pass, that will increase some of the Medi-Cal reimbursement rates. So we might be in a better position to see this bill going forward. But it, it really was a fascinating experience when you went in and you talked to legislators about they all had a story. Oh, either it was them, their kid, you know, I had one senator whose brother coaches a basketball team and gave me that whole story. So it's a, the policy I think is good. It's just trying to figure out A, the, the financial impact, and then also there's just some political waters to navigate through the process. I don't know, Dr. Calgut, you have any comment? Mm -hmm. Sure. Other than the financial considerations, what kind of obstacles are you running up against? What is their opposition to this? Like the Kaiser? Cost. It's the cost. It's all cost. money. It's money. It's the cost. Everyone will. They like the idea. Oh, it's a, in fact, a lot of people will, you mean that doesn't already happen? No, it doesn't. And so it really comes down to the cost. There also was a cost that was associated from the Department of Ed in terms of just the cost they put on to develop the, the form, of which, I don't, did you bring that form from Kentucky or to you show? Can put it up on the projector. Okay. So we, we then researched some other states that do it so that we could say, here, you can just take this and change it up. 
Um, the other issue was also we want to collect the data. So the other part is being able to have the uh, schools report to, and we're trying to still figure out to where, and that's one of the issues we're still pursuing. So we can kind of see, A, how many kids are getting a comprehensive eye exam, what types of things are being caught, um, and how can we improve the program, because down the road, we may want to include collecting more data um, in terms of other issues. So those are those are kind of the biggest obstacles. And I guess there's no way to quantify the cost of not doing this. Correct. I mean, yeah, I mean, you could try and say, well, you know, the cost, I mean, you, and we haven't even talked about kids in juvenile hall. We haven't talked about, I mean, so when you start going down the path, I mean, it could be a huge cost saver to the state. The problem is right now, I think the goal is let's just get this in and let's, let's get this first part in and then maybe there's some issues down the road that we can address some of those issues. And so this is a form from um, Kentucky. Kentucky. So it's a little bit more comprehensive, but we're kind of using this as an example. And I think if you scroll all the way down, there is a, I don't think you can opt out. So the thing, we would have an opt out feature on the form because you cannot mandate it in the state of California. You cannot deny a child the right to go to school based on this. And I don't think any of us want to do what happened with the, the vaccinations. <laughs> So this is kind of gives you an example. It's interesting because actually, I, it's not exactly like this, but I've seen some schools that have pulled out forms mm -hmm. that look actually very similar. Yeah, to, some uh, schools do it. Yeah. Some schools already do it. Um, but we want to make sure that it's included in the packet that parents get when they register their child for the first time. So you would also could get caught and you get another, if a child moves school districts, then they would get the packet again. So it's another opportunity for them to know the importance of getting an eye exam. Um, but I really think it also helps establish that relationship and sets the priority that eye care health is just as important to a child in their development as everything else. And it's just on entry, right, that we're still... Well, it's on, on entry, upon entry to a new school district, right. meaning if your child moves school districts, so whenever you get the packet to fill out, and you have to go see a doctor or a pediatrician, it would be included in that packet. I just have a question. Sure. Uh, this is just for public schools? How about private schools? Can't do, yeah, we can only do right okay. now. Okay. But what would be great though is to reach out to private right. schools and let them know that, that this is something that's happening in public schools. But I think for this first go around, our first bite at the apple should really be just focusing on public schools. And it's only K through, 12. 12. Even though we don't, it goes K through 12, but we, we didn't add in preschool and all of that right now just because, again, it's how do we get this, let's get it through once and then figure out, collect some data to be able to show that we're making an impact. Any other questions? Yes. No, I have a question. I wanted, I'd like to make a motion. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, let me just wait until everybody's yeah, here. Well, any other comments or questions for? Dr. Calvary, did you have any other comments? No. Any comments from? Yeah, I was just gonna, to Dr. McIntyre's point, I mean, Rachel did cover it, that the majority of the opposition is coming from cost, but another thing that was in the pediatrician's letter was that their guidelines for eye exams are different than optometry's guidelines. So in their official guidelines, it's they don't think a child needs to go in for a comprehensive eye exam if he or she is asymptomatic. So our studies clearly differ mm -hmm. from that. And so that's something we are kind of battling, our study versus your study. And while we think regardless, you know, you're going to catch more kids this way, that is um, a challenge that we will have to address again in this coming legislative session. And, and having attended the first work group, I was very um, impressed with the attendees because it was a very diverse group of folks, but I also serve on the American Optometric Association's clinical practice guidelines, and we've just put the final touches on the pediatric guideline, which really does emphasize this issue about symptomology. You know, you're asking a kindergartner to tell you whether or not they have headaches or double vision and some of these other things. So, so the evidence is pretty solid as far as that, that disconnect. We also have to keep in mind that the ACA actually requires that a child's comprehensive eye exam is part of that plan. So, so when we talk about some of these things, I, I think we, we need to keep in mind from a public standpoint, I think everybody around that table had a story to tell about 
When I was a kid, uh, we, we have public members that serve on our guideline writing group, and this one mother said, I did everything my pediatrician said I was supposed to do. We had a pediatrician on, he says, I was doing every test I thought I was supposed to do. I didn't know I was missing all of this. And, and that's what this does is it elevates the knowledge of, of the parent that when their kid goes to school, if they're not seeing well or if they're struggled, they're getting this labeled as attention deficit, um, having learning disabilities, all kinds of things. And so you take some of those labels off just by being able to identify what visual problems exist. Just a quick question too. Yeah. You know, so that's, as optometrists, we hear this all the time. And so this has been brought up, I'm sure, like when we talk to pediatric groups, what do they say? when they talk about, other than, well, our guideline is that not, if you're not symptomatic, what do they say in response? Because I haven't attended a coalition meeting, so. That's they, all we've gotten from them, too. Okay. So honestly, I mean, I think it'd be a good strategy to sit down with pediatricians early on to just see if <laughs> we can come to some middle point. I don't know if that's possible, but um, this has been going on for how many years, probably, our study versus their study. Um, it's unfortunate. And I'd be interested, because, you know, I work in because in their system, they send kids mm -hmm. all the time. I mean, we have a big department of optometry. We have 23 people between Woodland Hills and Thousand Oaks, which is where I work all the time. The pediatricians are sending kids. So I'm not other than cops, which I, yeah. I get that. But well, and I think part of it you've got to understand is you're dealing with their lobbyists and you're dealing with their advocates. You're not dealing with the actual physicians. physicians. And when I've talked to pediatricians directly, they're all for this. I mean, they love the idea. So same with school nurses. We've actually had school nurses come to our committee meetings and, oh, we love this idea. So part of it is just, it's the politics, um, which we will continue to maneuver around and work at, but, um, you know, we're not giving up. I mean, we'll keep going until it happens. I mean, I went to my one month, you know, just mm -hmm. so I went to my one month baby visit and got a list of everything I'm supposed to do up and through the time she goes to school. There are eye exams and, you know, make sure this is happening, make sure even if the pediatrician is just looking at it. So I'm just curious as to what the physician it, It's are. what the def it's they the define as a comprehensive eye exam. Yeah. So they okay. bill a comprehensive eye exam, but they're not doing posterior segment, eye teaming, yeah. focusing. The they're, if you're lucky, they're getting a refraction, but a lot of times it's automated testing. They put them, push oh, really? a button. Okay. Yeah, and they think that they're doing an eye exam. Yeah, because no, they send it to them. And that's, I mean, the pediatrician that served on our committee flat out said that. I've got, I've got the, you know, pig jumping over the dog thing, and I thought that that's all I needed. And, okay. and then come to find out that all of these other automated refractometers have limitations. Okay, interesting. And my daughter just had an eye turn. It's a, like the vision screening. Mm -hmm. She did not have a comprehensive eye exam. He told me to send, take her to an optometrist. Because yeah. he doesn't have time to, I mean, and that's the other issue is that with the, the constraints being put on healthcare in California and the restraint, you know, the, the lack of access, you know, it's also an access issue. And it's also looking at the fact that, you know, there are going to be kids that will go to a pediatrician and it's no slight to them. I mean, they're dealing with so many other issues, rise of diabetes in children, all kinds of deals. I mean, this is something I think we can take off their their radar and then make sure these kids are getting that comprehensive eye exam that's going to affect, that's going to have an impact on their entire life as well. And the, the, their psyche and their confidence and all kinds of things. Yep. So I'm speaking on behalf of the Optometric Association. Um, I just want to let you know that we are going to be putting in the full force of COA behind this bill. I mean, this is a huge priority for our members. It's even within our strategic plan. Um, it's been heartening. I've been having a lot of conversations with different legislators and groups in the past few months about this bill, and so far everyone's really excited about it. I think we're going to have really positive momentum, but it is still going to be a challenge. So, um, you know, we are going to be doing our part to try to get this passed, and I just want to let you know it will be uphill, but we do have a lot of momentum. So, I think moving forward, it's going to be a real positive year. Any other quick comments? So it's, it is it's about two o'clock, so we need to take a call. We can come I back. I have one quick comment, and then this is it. But to, to your point, um, and I'm speaking for on behalf of Dr. Gabucci as well, but I think for us, it's also asking each one of you to participate in the process, mm -hmm. which means talking to your own legislators, you know, talking to your own groups, finding community groups in your networks who can help us expand out in terms of who would support this bill, but really having all of you be advocates for this because it's going to take all of us 
to do this. And if you have questions or you need help, feel free to call me. I'm certainly happy to help you. But we really need all hands on deck if this is going to be a priority of the board. So we can definitely have a little more conversation after um, call so I can take them up. But while we're getting ready for that? Yes, I have uh, Secretary here. All right. uh, I have him on mute, but I let him know that kind of on a phone on a cart situation. All right. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead with this. So I'll give a, a quick rundown of what I provided in the memo. Remember, this is in response to some current concerns that were brought to the board last during last year. I believe Dr. Watt <coughs> presented on the item and the number of the concerns of how MBO is administered. And those concerns identify it centered around how NBO identifies students of cheating on the examination, the system malfunctions during the examination, and the lack of communication between NBO and the board. I provided to the members the letter that went out from the board to NBO and the response from NBO. When the board received the response back in writing, they requested that NBO participate in person and have an open dialogue with the board members. Unfortunately, MBO wasn't able to join us in person today, but they did agree to do a conference call so we can open it up to any questions to MBO that we have on the phone. Dr. Terry, the Chief Executive Officer from MBO, and I believe the MBO President, Dr. Rafferty. Uh, Dr. Rafferty is on there. there. He's gonna try and join um, okay. later on the call. So just I'm, I'm actually on. He's okay. on. Oh, right. okay. So just a quick clarification. So we're back on agenda item four, just for official time purposes. All right, um, Dr. Terry, Dr. Rafferty, is there any, any comments that you'd like to make before we take questions potentially from board members? They can. You should be sure after we're going. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's real faint on my phone, at least. Sorry, Dr. Terry, I moved you closer to Dr. Chala. Okay, so this is Dr. Chala, the board president, just asking if you'd like to make any um, introductory comments um, before we ask the board members to with for their questions. Bill, as board president, would you like to take the lead? Or? I, I, do well, um, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to ask. Thank you for okay. your invitation. We certainly uh, want to be uh, available to answer any questions that necessary meet with you in person but um, and and it's, it's very helpful to have dialogue and to address any issues that might come up in your mind or as you go through any process dealing with the, the national board so uh, we welcome your invitation and Jack I'll, I'll let you you made a comment or two if you'd like sure thanks uh, thanks to both uh, Dr. Rafferty and to the California board uh, for uh, uh, allowing us to speak with you this afternoon. <laughs> Obviously, the National Board takes very seriously its role in protecting the public uh, by developing, administering, uh, scoring, and then reporting those scores to the State Board of Ballot Assessment. Um, we have, as I think everyone knows, uh, a set of uh, exams, uh, the ones that you're most familiar with are those that are our entry-level knowledge exams. Uh, the part one, applied basic science. Part two, patient assessment management. The part three, the clinical skills exam. And then uh, since 1985, we've administered a standalone treatment and management of ocular disease. Uh, to, to existing practitioners, and then in 1993, embedded the PMOD exam into part, uh, part two. But over time, uh, practice level continuing updated knowledge exams uh, were developed by the National Board to include the continued professional development and optometry exam and uh, a standalone injection exam. The specialty knowledge exam, uh, that came into existence in 2005 with the advanced competence in medical optometry exam. That 
he is taken by a wide variety of optometrists, but largely it was always designed for residency trained optometrists. So that's just, again, thank you uh, very much, and uh, we'd be glad to try to uh, answer any questions uh, that the board has. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to go around the table and ask uh, board members if they have, have any questions. I'll just gonna start there, but I'll start there. Is it Granby? I don't think he's going to be able to hear, so I'm going to stand Come closer. up and move around. <laughs> yes. And maybe that's going to be easier. For the cameraman as well. Oh, <laughs> so this is Sid Branvine. I'm one of the board members. And it really disappoints me to hear that students are really discouraged about pursuing a career in optometry because of their experience with an exam. And I'm not certain how this will get better when we're out accusing students of cheating when they may not have been because a statistic may have identified that they had the probability or possibility of, quote, cheating. It not only discourages them, but boy, does it really impact their psyche at such a young age with the professional world. Isn't there a way that we as a board can find out ahead of time when there's irregularities, there's issues, so that we can be part of the solution with the schools? Um, candidates are, are never accused of cheating. That's the, that's the behavior. Um, the result of the commitment to the national board is that the, release, the, the results are being used for public protection. There is an assumption by the state board that those results reflect their clinical skills and their knowledge and not that of someone else. So the results are based on similarity similarity patterns. And when they get to astronomically high values, it's not just the national board of uh, MBTO, but it's uh, really across the board that those untrustworthy results cannot be released to the state board. And that's just standard common practice. The national board actually goes way out of its way to take many, many factors into consideration before even considering that results are untrustworthy. Uh, number one, the index value has to be a 7.5 or greater. That means a 10 to the 7.5 power, or around 1 in 33 million. Most often, though, the results are far, far higher than that index values of 10, uh, 15, um, and are, are uh, and that has, it has to be considered. Number two, when the forensics are run, the forensics company has no way of knowing uh, whatsoever where these candidates are seated. They know at what site they, they took their exam, but that's all. And when the results come back to us, we're given OE tracker numbers and the index size and the pairs that have been grouped. We then go through, unseal the seating chart key, and make the determination whether they were or were not sitting juxtaposed to each other. 
in every case except one, and I'll review that in just a second if I may, they have been sitting right next to each other, left, right, or front, back. This, uh, this march with the under the key, uh, those of us who are unseeing it, that is different than the uh, individuals that make the seating, the random seating assignments. And we do do both things independently. We found someone who, on our chart, was supposed to have been seated in the front left side. But the pair that that candidate was associated with was in the, in the middle of the room somewhere. And this was the first time in numerous years where there was that kind of discrepancy. We then called the other managers, brought over all the proctor sheets, and realized that the candidate had uh, come up with an excuse got the, the proctor to move her uh, to another seat. And the seat then that was open where she was assigned was right next to the candidate that the index value showed she was paired with. But it goes far beyond even the seating juxtaposition. Uh, we often find that the candidate uh, who have untrustworthy results, have taken the exam for three or four or more uh, previous occasions. And that's always a, a great concern. Uh, we've even had a few who have uh, shown up on multiple years. And that is taking consideration to the exam booklets are pulled so that we can see which candidate has doodled, has written, where there are calculations, where there, there's a lot of information in the one test booklet and hardly anything in the, um, um, in the other books. So there's a high level of, of comfort that at best the, the results are untrustworthy and cannot be uh, with, a, a, with for the purposes that they're intended to safeguard the public uh, be released to the state board. Well, th this is Sid with one last comment. I can see that perhaps there may be a small percentage within that who indeed should be thrown out, but not at the numbers that we're seeing. I find it even harder to accept that just because I had a really great teacher and that information that was imparted, that knowledge stuck with me and I was able to repeat it back and my co-students did the same thing, that that's considered, what is it called, not cheating? Unsworthy trustworthy results. Yes, there you have it. So in essence, we're hoping that students retain what they learn, but we better not repeat back what the teacher teaches us because in on an exam because we could be docked for it. That's all I'll say because I know my colleagues will likely cover the other things that are on my mind. Yeah. And actually, that never happened. Uh, I, I'm not sure where that notion possibly could have come from. First of all, the analysis is not done largely based on correct to correct responses. The response, as I had indicated in the letter, is largely based on misinformation. Yes, one could be imparted misinformation, but of, of a classroom that might have 50 to 100 candidates, that then that misinformation would tr transcend across numbers of students. And it is very rare very rare when there is more than one or two candidates that are 
uh, have untrustworthy results at one particular institution. If it was based on good information, going to good students, and they're being asked, then there would be, if that's in any way the way the forensics was handled, we would, of course, expect many, many uh, combinations to show up. So instead of the statistics being about 1%, uh, it's not 50% or any other suggestion, it's about 1%. Then, um, and 1% 1 of 1,800 is, is 18 candidates for a March administration. Now, fortunately for the August administration, the, the number was less than 1%. And so that was, was much, much better. Um, so yeah, it's a very small number, but they, the clarity uh, in both the index values, the seating arrangements, the test book list evaluation, the propensity for this to occur uh, across candidates who have taken the exam multiple times um, is a, a pretty clear pattern. Jack, uh, this is Bill. Um, and and uh, I, I didn't catch your name that asked the question, uh, but I apologize. Uh, it's a little hard to hear on the, on the speakerphone here. But uh, I'll just add one thing. Um, as everyone knows, or it's been well known for a while now, uh, uh, part two um, has uh, been done with computer-based testing, and part one is now moving to computer-based testing. And that changes the dynamic significantly uh, in terms of the uh, seating. There will be no more random seating and that type of thing in these exams. So, really talking about that historical perspective of what's happened in the past. Uh, the next administration of part one uh, will be by uh, computer-based testing. I, I am correct, aren't I, Jack? Yes, absolutely. March 21st through uh, the 24th. So this, this is uh, historical now. I mean, the next, you know, we're talking about what we'll do in the future. I think moving to computer-based testing, while there is not 100%, there could be a, a cheating scheme going on, it's unlikely, less likely, um, there's people in cubicles and, and those type of things, and, and with proctors and in a different manner. So um, I think that's important when we talk about the future, not, not the future, because right now we're not talking about uh, we have four more administrations this way. Uh, it, 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 the administrations on a seating arrangement like that are, are complete. So the next administration will be computer-based testing. So, yep, absolutely. Uh, um, this is Dr. Wong, uh, Lillian Wong, and it's my understanding that even though you are moving to a computer-based system for part one, that you're still retaining the services of the statistics um, company that checks for cheating even with the computer-based uh, computer um, testing for both part one and part two? Uh, Dr. Wong, the caveat will not be able to run the same algorithm uh, that they use. Uh, yet we do ask them to run their forensics on part two for the same reason. And if there was something very aberrant that showed up, and there never has been, and we have no reason to believe that uh, that insight for part one will ever show up anything. As Bill, clear, as Bill pointed out, it's very helpful. The dynamics at a Pearson testing center are very, very different, and the, uh, the likelihood of being able to have an untrustworthy result that same station being extremely remote. Now, I'll just add one more thing, and that's that um, uh, I've served on the North Carolina State Board for 18 years, just uh, taken over as executive director. Um, and it, it's always um, an important factor to consider. You have to weigh the two. Uh, the, the idea of being fair and partial and 
certainly giving everybody a chance at the same time a public protection issue of, of, of the state board, making sure that those people that are, are practicing have met the standards and have also demonstrated their confidence in a, in a satisfactory way. And so the national board doesn't go looking for problems and trying to find people. Uh, you know, some of these people that have, have been identified have been identified in multiple stations. So um, it's not just, you know, the, the, the exam's not given all at once, it's in different, different stations over time. And there's one candidate last time, I think, had a, in, in the several millions uh, on four different stations. So it, it's kind of hard, you know, the probability of that, you can, you can win five lotteries before the height, the probability of that happening would probably take place. So I, I, you know, I just, I throw that out. Well, I, I, I understand that with the... interested in being fair and, and certainly getting everybody the benefit of the doubt, but when statistics are, are you know, everybody hates statistics. I, I could be the first to admit it, except maybe the type of attrition and, and, and Jack. Uh, I understand that. But, but the truth of the matter is, if you just ignore it, then what are you potentially doing? I mean, you have to, you have to consider, you know, the public protection and safety issue, too. So. I just throw that out. Okay. Yep. And one of Bill's points that I didn't emphasize before, uh, besides looking at the numbers, the seating chart, the third variable actually is on our chart is that so often the, the candidates are, the, the part one exam is actually administered in four sessions in the past. So in the past, there's been Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon. And uh, Cavion took each test because each exam had 125 items. And that was uh, sufficiently powerful that they could run their analysis uh, well on each session. And what we would find in the vast majority of the cases uh, of that one percent or so, that they had high index values across multiple sessions. And so what Bill was getting at is this last time uh, we had uh, several people who had untrustworthy results in three and four sessions. And uh, that is like winning the lottery on three or four successive days. Right, and you, but you guys say that you have skilled proctors. Do these skilled proctors watch for any suspicious activities or are you base, basing everything solely on the statistics? Uh, occasionally there are uh, proctor comments, but the literature shows that the proctors are willing to walk around, they, they have been trained, they know what they're supposed to do. We do get proctor comments, but the literature shows that the proctor comments are not very valuable. So you're basing this solely on some, statistics. But uh, very few testing organizations like ours are relying on proctor uh, reports. Okay, uh, this is Dr. Glenn Kawaguchi. Um, thank you, doctors, for being on the phone. So there's a saying that sometimes ignorance is bliss, but I want to kind of put, put yourself in my position where as opposed to you as a group coming to us to let us know about potential irregularities during test procedure proceedings, we started hearing it from individuals taking the tests as well as the schools of optometry in California. So I wanted to point out that the letter that you sent us on February 17th to Dr. Chawla, I appreciated that letter. It had a lot of useful information for myself as a board member. And I think it raises that opportunity then that what is your plan to increase the communications that you have with state boards like California? 
Well, I'm not sure if you're talking about this topic or just in the general concept of uh, broad communication. Uh, we try to cover as much of this, including the forensics, as we possibly can for all the state board members that are able to attend the Marvo annual meeting. Uh, the National Board puts on a three-hour workshop and uh, there's a lot of material to cover, uh, but we try to get all the high points, all the relevant topics, uh, changes from year to year depending on what is uh, most pressing, most topical at the time. And, uh, uh, and, and I think that helps. We also, for the colleges and the schools, schools optometry, uh, each school has a liaison. So during usually the month of April or May, uh, we several months in, uh, in advance announce the workshop that we're going to put on uh, in form of a webinar and go through a lot of this information uh, as well as other much more mundane like registration, uh, registration deadlines, which continue to uh, negatively affect some optometry students because for the whole process to work, there is there are some deadlines, and we try to get those out at least a year uh, or a year and a half in advance. But so just uh, I know that students get frustrated when they miss those deadlines. We also publish a lot of this information. You probably received in the past a couple days, the past week, the latest edition of Test Point. Uh, we are real good about publishing a detailed summary of a lot of these same topics. Uh, our standard settings, equating, that uh, sometimes seems confusing. The, uh, the forensic, uh, the morphing, as Dr. Rafferty has pointed out earlier, of part one, two CBT, all that highlighted in great depth uh, in test point. And depending on which issue it is, we choose different different topics uh, <coughs> to really acknowledge. But there's a lot of useful information there, including performance data that is uh, important for, for everyone to understand. So, uh, those are some of the ways that uh, we communicate when or uh, what more, much more in depth, or even other optometric associations like much more in depth information. Uh, we do our best to want to come visit personally the, the board uh, when that's possible, uh, follow it up, or, or if that's there's a temporal delay, go ahead and send a, a detailed uh, response and try to communicate with uh, providing the depth that we think the board would like. So, so, so can, I, can I interject? Kate? Can I interject? Um, so my, my feedback to you in general is, I don't think that we, so I'm talking about the California Board of Optometry, and you as a group, have done a good enough job in our communications and our proactive communications around some of the details that we need so that we are the first in line to hear about information about irregularities, um, testing changes, some of the risks, some of the analysis. We are not able to always attend ARVO meetings. And so we're gonna need to work with you, I believe, on alternate methods to increase our communication and something we look forward to discussing more with you. Uh, and likewise, one of the proposals before the board, and I don't know if this helps the California situation um, in terms of travel, we had talked last year about instead of having the Arvo workshop, or maybe even in supplement, supplementing to the Arvo workshop, uh, is actually having multiple meetings here at the National Board Office and having the state board uh, here as our guest and be able to really develop a lot of these topics and be able to 
seeing the, the nation of work facility and see each other, um, have these conversations and really develop the topic. And I'd like to see that happen. I know it's, it's very expensive. Um, it's time consuming for people. And in certain jurisdictions, it's not even possible, uh, regrettably, because of the travel restrictions. But whatever it's going to take, uh, the National Board stands ready to do it. Dr. Terry, um, I believe Dr. Wong has a few more questions. Um, I understand, I have, well, I have a lot of questions, but I guess one of the ones that's, I guess, most disconcerting, I teach at UC Berkeley School of Optometry, and listening to the, just even just your simple computer malfunctions that were happening the last couple of sessions is really disturbing. I talked to a couple of students who said that, which one was it? Um, I think it was the, earlier this year that one of them, a couple of them had to reboot their computer 15 to 20 times during different test sessions because of some computer glitches and that you guys knew about this starting with East Coast testing and then it continued to the West Coast testing and Hawaii. So I'm just, I'm just baffled because this happened the previous year and then it happens again. And if you, it just, if you, if this is such an important test, which it obviously is, I just don't understand how, how this, continues to be a repeating pattern. It's actually not a repeating pattern. Um, the, in 2014, the uh, occurrence was that a relatively um, student, they, they had um, the computer shut down so towards the end of the, towards one of the tests. In the coding, so that when some student who chose to start the exam in the afternoon session only, and then went to the 175th item, when they then answered the 175th item and hit next, the computer was code uh, as written by Pearson thought that they were done. So they kept the system. That was very Right, and so those students who had, let's say, um, marked questions they, that they wanted to go and review um, were unable to. Correct? We were able to give candidates a recap they could take the Right, so I guess for me, knowing or having met so many students, this was pretty traumatic for them. They had been studying for this test, they now have to wait three more months, and in addition, it affected, I think, applications for residencies for a lot of these students. They, they didn't have test scores to submit for residency applications. And this happened, this, that, so that happened that time, and then, was it like nine months later, you had that major computer glitch. So I'm, I'm just, I think you know, going to a computer-based system is fantastic. Um, you know, we've been working very hard with our collaborator, Pearson um, Hughes. Pearson is a very reputable company. Uh, the two big players in the industry, of course, are Prometrics and Pearson. Dr. Rafferty, uh, our IT director and CEO, uh, and I went to the Pearson headquarters in January because we were appalled by this as faculty and obviously the, the candidates that were put in the situation. And we wanted to know why I, there was a computer glitch. And as you said, why did it happen? It was a different glitch the second year. So how did it happen? They they had their best team there, their computer designer, um, and explained it all. We then went back um, and redeveloped the our timeline because we felt that if we had if Pearson had been able to have more time, then they would have found both problems uh, 
know, much, much earlier. Dr. Terry? And then they could have fixed this, and none of it would have happened. So we thought that was probably the variable that at least we could, on the national board, uh, by fix. Dr. We Terry? don't have the control that is necessary so, for their code writing. So now that we're now that we're going to a computer-based system, everything's solved for part one and part two. What happens if there's more computer issues? You're going to make the students wait another three months, and then they can take that test again for without charge. But then that's a three-month delay, which isn't fair to the yeah, students because it's not their I fault. Have to die with that law. Uh, as you remember, the exam was administered first on. December like 2nd and 4th, uh, and then the candidates were given the opportunity, if they wanted, to take it again in January. And a number of candidates said, look, I'm already prepared. Uh, I'll let the holidays get past me. I'll be more relaxed. I may have a chance to review my notes uh, one additional time. And I'll take it in early January. As I recall, it's like January 4th or 5th or 5th. So it's just, uh, it was a matter of three or four weeks to give them the option to retake it. So Dr. So Terry, if they this want is... to do that, then they were given the option to take it again in April. So these are choices that the candidates made. Dr. Terry, this is Dr. Chala. I wanted to actually just, in the interest of time, I wanted to make um, just a, a motion. I think that we've asked all our questions for the most part, but um, we're gonna make a motion to create a work group at the board to address any and all concerns that we have with the national board so that way we can reach out to you directly and maybe continue the conversation in the future. Well, we appreciate it. We certainly appreciate uh, the time that you've uh, allowed us to uh, discuss these topics this afternoon. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Um, so that's, that's just a motion. That's on the table. So you want to, what was your friend name? Yes. Or find out if we're in a there isn't one. There isn't one. I know, but it's in our statute. Well, that's actually, you know that's not true. The state board can assume it again. So that, that decades the ago. The alternative, like, before we switch to... So before we switch to MEA, the board did implement the exam uh, several, um, I want to say decades ago. Yeah, it was but, over a decade. Yeah, I... I don't know what the solution is to then say, say schools, do you want to take this back on? That's, but that's something that this work group can decide. We, the work group can work with NDEO to work through all of the concerns and then decide if, if the, it's something that the board would want to take on. I, I, just, I just think having talked to a number of different people from the various schools, that when all of this was going down for like since 2014, that the NBEO was very non-responsive to the schools when they when they had these untrustworthy results. Mm -hmm. These students appealed to their deans, the deans then appealed to the board to the NBEO, and they, they weren't really getting any feedback. So it sort of it was a very sort of one-sided decision. And you know, these poor kids, they're just sitting there going, someone told me that I cheated. And, Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but um, it, it was it was a very one-sided conversation. So I think that if we could have something where we get feedback from the NBO and if we can have conversation with them, <coughs> someone has to have conversation with them. Well, if they're going to engage in full faith, then that's one thing. And basically, you're appealing to the people who told you that you have the unreliable results, and they're telling you, uh, well, it's unreliable, it's unreliable based on statistics. And maybe the work group is, you know, will will inspire them to be more engaged exactly. and respond to the concerns because, again, California is it's a it's, it's the, we have three schools, it's three big schools. Dog. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we ask them to show up. And this is what this is the third nine time. months later, yeah. and they, they still time. can't come. So it seems it's like let's, let's see if they can come to the table with authentic. 
good I mean, this faith to Dr. Taguchi's yeah. and Dr. Taguchi's okay. point of better communication. We don't have any. Well, they just, they just really, it hasn't been any communication. No. And then when we ask them about it, they just kind of well, service this. this they circularly yeah. And then their letter to us also, it's the same sort of circular. Like, yeah. Yeah. And maybe even the convert, even just having them understand that this board is very seriously concerned and that we will start evaluating options if they are not going to engage. But not if not, you, you know, I don't want to go out of the gate on that, but at the same time, but you know, someone keeping your options talking, open right? and let's, let's have a conversation, let's talk about all of these issues that have been going on for two years. Mm -hmm. I want to make a comment, uh, and I think Dr. Wong already assumes that all the public members understand this, but oh, that's true. Um, <laughs> going to school for so many years and then you're kind of nearing the, that finish line, but there's some tests that you got to get through. And they're hard. You have to study hard for them. And you, you not only wrap your education in your head about it, but you also have to emotionally be prepared. Yeah. And then the, the, <laughs> to just suddenly there be an inconsistency in the testing and be told, well, if you'd like, you can come back and for free take tests in uh, four weeks. Are you kidding? It, it totally. <laughs> throws you off. And well, so then, even yeah. if you maybe could have easily passed that first go around, there's all these dots that start to swirl in your head. Yep. And you start wondering. And it, it really becomes a, an objective, possibly unfair process when you start to get to those kind of points. And well, it's not fair to the, the passage rate going the second time, the, the more you take a standardized test like that, the your rate of passage goes down, down substantially. I mean, I know Bar Exam, I think it's what, 30% wow. less of an opportunity to pass the second time around, and they get that test biannually. Yep. So, what, you, you fail in July? Oh, you get to take it again, you know, in February. Can you these imagine? Are, these are same thing, yeah, terrible. Same thing. But you know, like the statistics that he was talking about, oh, it's 10 to the seventh mm -hmm. power. It's extrapolated out. I mean, you have like 2,000 kids taking this test. And then they figure it out. Mm -hmm. it's someone in the statistics department at Berkeley explained it to me that the formula that they're using is sort of what the credit card companies use to identify um, unusual shopping on your credit card. But then they go and, and follow up on it. But the NBEO is using something very similar to identify uh, a, 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 a fraudulent. Un, fraudulent, possible fraudulent answers. And then they're saying, these are unreliable results period, you have to take it again. And there's like, you could video, I guess you could video the exam the exam rooms, or you have these proctors, so it just seems a little one-sided, yeah. No, and then to say that, well, we have the proctors, but nobody actually finds that right. useful. Okay, well then do something else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah. And then, you know, and then they're also continue to use this forensics company yeah. for the computerized part, which I think is just kind of strange. If you're saying that these computerized tests that can randomize the questions, so, and you have certain kinds of screens where no one else can see into the screens, <coughs> why do you need to enlist the service of the statistics company if part one and part two is, is now going to be computerized? And then, uh, I just it just seems a little odd. I mean, it is. So um, that's my input on it. Do we need a motion on the work group? I mean, what do we do and how Oops. do we bring this to a close? Yeah, I just that was the motion is to create a work group to address any all concerns with the NBO. And I think what we'll do the same thing we always do if you're interested. Um, let Jessica know we'll get a work group together. I will take public comment, don't worry. Um, so that's that's the motion. And if I can I'll make the motion. Can I get a your second? That's fine. Whatever. Anything whatever you want. I, I, I'd like to volunteer to be on. <laughs> I, I know. I, mean, I, I sense that. What? Um, what? So just let Jessica know if you're interested in that. So that's. Yes. Can I make one last comment? I, sure. I, I have supreme faith in all the board members, but you know, as we tread on on, on this endeavor, um, make sure the message is the board of optometry thinks you caught too many cheaters. You know, we want to make sure that the, the test is fair and that that the, that that people who are innocent are not unjustly accused. Right. Not that we're concerned that they're catching too many people. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a good point, and that's the perspective that we always um, Now I will take a look on that. So, so I want to commend this board for undertaking this, because 
certainly being an academic, this, this is not new. I, he's talking and I'm like, welcome to my world, because we've had these conversations ad nauseum. Um, there are a couple, couple topics and items, and certainly this cheating issue is very discouraging because from a student's perspective, it is being accused of something that you don't feel you did. And I think there's some statistical flaws because if you got a 7.5 and I got a 7.5 criteria, then it doesn't matter. But just because I happen to be sitting next to him, now it's, you know, and, and again, and maybe they've got additional statistics to look at that. But, you know, what, what transpired? Because this is something new. This was not something that they've done all along. It seems to be something in the last four or five, maybe six years that we've seen more and more of. Um, and either they're you know cheating more or something is flawed in their analysis or their assumptions. Secondly is this computerized based system. Certainly the way if you've ever, the OAT is now a computerized based system, you're taking it with somebody from the architect licensing board or whatever. So hopefully you're not cheating off of them. But <laughs> more importantly, this glitch system, they've only been doing it computerized for the last four or five years. So now, you know, we've got baseball averages that are better batting averages than that. And the first time it completely kicked them out of the system, this last time was a boot reboot. It was, and, the, was, and the transparency was most traumatizing was because they knew back east. And it wasn't NBEO that contacted anybody at West no. Coast. It was other schools and colleges deans. And therefore, that's a problem because the communication you know, do you want to sit there and save the student from having to go through a test that might glitch them out? Mm -hmm. Some workstations, some of the testing centers said, hey, don't hit submit, hit review. You know, so, so you know, it, it all of a sudden it becomes a nightmare for an already nightmarish exam. It's a rolling thing from East Coast to West Coast. I mean, they knew, knew about it starting on the East Coast, and then it just kept on going. And what about another Remind, I made this in, in the context of another issue, but whenever this board uh, transfers its uh, authority to a third party, we always have to think about, well, if it doesn't work out with a third party, what's our exit plan? Right. I, I say this in the context of our considerations of OE tracker. Um, we gotta be able to have an exit plan. If yeah, it historically it wasn't the schools that did the test, actually the state the board. board. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. right. okay, sorry. All right, so we had a motion, we had a second. Um, any other comments, public comments, or board comments? All right, take a roll call vote. Rachel? Aye. Mark? Aye. Ruby? Aye. 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 All right, motion passes. So just let Jessica know um, by email today, whenever you like, Zoom. Uh, so just to go back to agenda item 13, um, I just had a final comment. I mean, I, I really am happy with the work that we've done on this. It's actually a topic near and dear to my heart. I actually wear glasses and all of that, can't see very well far away without them. I was lucky. I have a mom who's a nurse, and she took me in, and she was very conscientious about how she did stuff, because that's what she does. But I have plenty of examples myself, you know, people that I was in school with can't see, work, have worse prescriptions than I do, didn't get glasses till they were much older, and it was a problem. You know, I know Dr. Kawaguchi has mentioned on numerous occasions the confidence that comes with just actually, you know, or the, the blow to your confidence that comes with being kind of labeled and put in different categories. Um, I was lucky I didn't have to go through that. So I am very happy with the fact that we're undertaking this. Thank you both for kind of doing that and taking the ownership and leading that discussion on that. So those are just my comments. Um, any other comments on this topic? Any other public comment on this topic? Should I, did you, ra you raise your hand? No. Okay. Um, agenda item 40. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'd like to make a motion that the board support the legislative concept and direction of the Children's Vision Work Group and ask that the work group members take a really strong role working with staff to move forward with introducing the legislation in the 2017 legislative session. I'll second. <laughs> Any other discussion? May I? Any other? I, I defer, I'd like to be heard on just one issue. That's on agenda item 13? Yes. Okay. Um, any other additional? 
comments? Public comments? Okay, and we'll do roll call vote, Rachel. I. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm eminently forgettable, I understand. The question is whether, um, just for my own clarification, uh, is it support or sponsor? Because I've, I've heard it very various ways. I just Because those to me are a little bit different. Support is if somebody else that you introduces a piece of legislation, the board is on, the board's on board. Right. Or a sponsor is like we, we direct we, we direct the executive officer to go find an author, as I understand. So Actually, the worker. I would sponsor that the work group help the work group find, find the sponsor with support of the staff. Okay, so we'll sponsor it, but the work group will be the mechanism, I guess. Is that it? Correct. Because okay. the, the board has to, the board can sponsor right. it and delegate it to the work group to do the heavy lifting. We're sponsoring it, but they're taking the lead. Gotcha. The work groups. Do you want to restate your? So, how about I restate it too? Uh, the board sponsor the legislative concept and direction of the children's division work group and ask work group members together with staff to move forward with introducing legislation in the 2017 legislation session legislative session he's okay so now it needs a second again oh, there we go. Or any additional comments than you? Yes. Yeah, Just a real quick question for clarification. So this motion, are you like supporting the proposal or the okay. concept? The concept and the direction. Okay. And then it's up to the work group to work through it, finding the sponsor, working with the interested parties. Yeah, all the stakeholders, all everything. Okay. She wants to make it a priority. Yeah, okay, got it. Well, I just have some like questions on the um, proposal, but I can send those in a letter. She's just, it's been going on for years, and so she's asking just to make it a priority. That's the yeah. intent behind it. Make it happen. Yes. Okay. okay. Elevate. Yeah. <laughs> Doctor, do you guys have any opposition to her motion? She wants it done. So, um, any other Hopefully. comments? discussion and possible action and recommendations regarding mobile clinics and potential legislative proposed I'm going to have Joanne just give a brief overview and then we'll hear again from the work group members. Hi, uh, Mr. Behind this one, this is also based on another bill. Uh, the board ran last legislative cycle, uh, SB 349. This bill unfortunately did not get out of committee. Um, what this is focusing on is mobile clinics since licensure is tied to a specific location. Mobile clinics can become a lot more dicier situations. Um, previous language uh, was based off of dental board. They have a they have mobile clinics in their statutes. It's different than what has been discussed, but that's what the original language is based off of. Uh, the board has reviewed this and decided to reapproach it in a new way rather than just running a the same bill over again. Uh, this was also discussed at the legislation regulation committee meeting this past month. Um, the work group for this uh, is Dr. Wong and uh, Rachel. So mobile clinic. Um, my personal opinion on this is that there's a lot of gray area. We don't even really know what mobile clinic is. Kurt, correct me if I'm wrong, we've looked, and there's really no statute pertaining to mobile clinic. There's no defendant no defendant Yeah, so, you know, is a mobile clinic a van that drives up? Is it doing an online refraction on your phone? Is it um, a, an optometrist showing up in your house? Is it going to, an, I mean, there's zero clarification on really what it is. So I think a recommendation was, in, and then when you start talking about mobile clinic, you start going down this rabbit hole and all of these other issues start coming out. Insurance, access, um, ADA requirements, you know, all kinds of different things. And so our recommendation was actually 
to, first of all, the board, to my knowledge, at least since I've been on the board, has never had a full conversation about mobile clinic in terms of where, what do people think, you know, what are different ideas pertaining to this issue. So the first step is to have a special meeting where we really discuss this issue because I do know there are companies outside of California that are chomping at the bit to come into California. So the question is, do we let the private sector take the initiative and we react to what the private sector wants? Or do we take the initiative and, and be a leader in this issue in terms of going forward with what we think this, this policy should be? So first, it's having a full meeting with the board to have that discussion. And then at that meeting, you could almost take all of these different issues and every single person on this board could take a role in a work group in researching and listening to stakeholders on different aspects of mobile clinic. Um, you know, this, I, I honestly do not see that we are in any position to introduce legislation anytime soon on this. There are so many stakeholders, there are so many interested parties from the business sector to the healthcare arena to the insurance arena to the legislature to groups that represent low income folks that want to make sure that they have access to things that this is a huge, huge deal to take on. And um, my recommendation, and this is just my part, is that we slow down, we first start with a conversation, we figure out what our strategy would be, and if there is even a will from this board to move forward and taking any kind of role in this. Or again, waiting and seeing if their private sector or other interested folks will introduce legislation that we can then pipe in on. I don't know if there's any, Lillian or Maria, do you have any other comments? Time. I think that's a good recommendation that we have a separate meeting to discuss this issue. I think we just we need to come up with a, a definition of what a yeah, mobile clinic is. Yeah, we don't even know what it is. Yeah, coming up with that first will give us a good sort of just beginning point to kind of figure yeah. everything else out. You had stakeholders for this too, right? Come and comment on Well, we so we've had two meetings. One we did in conjunction with Children's Vision that Glenn was at, that we, we kind of talked a little bit about it. Um, but then we had a broader discussion at the Leg Reg Committee meeting, and we had a pretty good, I think, conversation there as well. Um, but it definitely needs, that's why I think having a standalone board meeting that's noticed, that we send out, that stakeholders, because again, there are stakeholders from outside California that want to be part of this discussion. And so I think having that, um, is the first step because that'll help us knowing who the players are will help in defining what do we want to have as a mobile clinic i mean you already have companies coming in now starting the online refractions it's already it's already here so what kind of role are we going to play and so you know that's the way i would start it because i don't think we did as much outreach on the mobile clinic as we did on children's vision because at the time we really didn't know what we were but i've done a ton of research on this issue there are a lot and of I've talked to a lot of people from different aspects of this, and this is a huge, huge, huge issue that changes actually how you're going to be doing healthcare, not just for optometry, but other parts of healthcare in California. So it's part of a broader discussion. So, going back quite a bit in time. <laughs> the, uh, this subject was originally brought up out of concern about applying the grayish laws that already exist to the potential enforcement issues that we as a board may, be re may or may not be responsible for. So that was the original, to my recollection, intent of how the subject was brought up. So I guess my question to the work group would be, because uh, one of the options is looking at maybe uh, more specific details so that we don't lose the flavor of that original proposal to bring this as a subject. Um, is that something that we are responsible for currently? So I do understand the, the grayness to the laws that exist around mobile clinics. However, our still our core core role is consumer protection now. So as opposed to opening up such a big thing, um, is there a possibility that we can focus more specifically on looking at the laws that already exist 
and potential enforcement action that we need to be paying more attention to that is currently going on. So correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's what happened when this bill was originally introduced. And once you introduce the bill, all these other things are just gonna come come out come out. Does that make sense? So once you it, it's hard I think it's hard because once you start doing that little piece it opens the crack a little bit and then suddenly the floodgates will open and I think that's what started happening when this bill was for I wasn't involved when the bill was first introduced but it didn't even make it to committee it didn't even that they didn't even really do anything with it and the reason why is so many people started coming out of the woodwork once they saw that we were trying to do one little thing pertaining to mobile clinic yeah, it did and so I think the problem is is that you can only do I mean the reality is we can say we want to introduce legislation, but the minute there's an author, it's not really our bill anymore. The author can do with it what they would like. So I think a better course of action is to really vet this issue. If issues come up from the private sector, we can definitely have input, but I understand what you're saying. I just think the challenge is going to be just the way it works. The minute you open it a little bit, it you know all these other folks well why aren't you doing this why aren't you doing that even legislators will say well what what are you doing about online refractions what are you doing about this and i think we look better knowing that we're going in having vetted all of these issues before we try to take the legislative approach that's just my opinion well, and also searching for an author i think it's only fair to tell the author hey yeah. Hi, we'd love that. for you to be a sponsor of this bill but here are all the things that are yeah. on the pipeline because a lot of them might say no thank you or great i'm looking yeah. for something like this because the worst thing is that you end up putting the author in a bad position that they weren't anticipating my other comment would be I appreciate the enforcement issue, but from my perspective, I'm thinking enforce what? We don't know what a mobile clinic is. I, I don't even know how to enforce that. What is it? Are we enforcing your, your truck of your car? Is it the, the, how how do we enforce that? That's so. Again, I think discussing what a mobile clinic is is probably a good place to start. In in my opinion. Well, I think it's pick your battles. I mean, if children's right. vision is something that we really want to focus on, you know, maybe we focus on that first while we're having these meetings and, and whatever on the mobile clinic side. And again, we can't stop the private or any other interested parties for introducing legislation, but as long as we're having the discussions about it, at least we'll have a seat at the table. perceived to be negligent on in duty of care given that the definition is not super clear uh, well I'm not so sure about the care issue right now we do have something called an extended optometrical clinical facility that has to be aligned with the teaching program so that's about that's in our regulations now so I would think that as the board goes forward doing whatever it does, it would want to make sure that the standard of care provided on a mobile site, whatever those are, would be roughly equivalent, if not the same, as the traditional bricks and mortar, uh, because we don't want to be in a position of saying, oh, well, I'm sorry this bad act happened, but you got it, you got it at, you know, uh, mobile X is R Us or something, and that's just the way it goes. So the, I, don't think, I don't think you want to have two different standards of care. I do want to emphasize one thing that Ms. Mitchell has said. I mean, mobile has the connotations, I think, as I discussed in, at, the, at the committee of, you know, like a school bus or the blood mobile or, or whatever. But thinking about it, because, you know, I need another hobby, thinking about it a little bit more would be, this could be something where it's actually a bricks and mortar place, but it's populated by the practitioner once a week or twice a week. And so that's mobile, and it's not, the, it's not, primary place but it's, it serves as happen those there so uh, you know like I said I think that core building block of what kind of what kind of arena the services are going to be provided in is the critical point to jump off from as the board considers the next steps so as a follow-up question to that um, we do have certain laws that are a lot clearer such as statement of licensure branch office we have those aspects that we're 
fairly clear on. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I just want to make sure that we're not saying that the mobile clinic laws are so vague that we don't have other laws. I just want to be mindful that we don't want it to, to appear that we as a board are just going to mm -hmm. throw our hands up in the air because um, that could mean that chaos could ensue and people think that they have this yeah, free reign to do whatever they want in the state. And that's not the case because we do have existing law that we're very clear on as a board. So I just want to make that as a point as well. And Dr. Kaniguchi, I absolutely agree. In fact, most of the boards within Consumer Affairs have embraced this sort of um, the out-of-state provision where practitioners come, come in from out-of-state for a, for a unique purpose to, to offer care because there may be not enough care offered in certain geographical areas. So I think the table's set. I don't disagree with you. I just think it's, I think it's important to recognize that the enforcement concerns, the licensing concerns are such that, you know, when we tell an addressee, you gotta have an address of record. You gotta have a place where we can go serve you. I don't think this board wants to be positioned if something goes awry, we're chasing, not that you couldn't get a high rate of speed down 405, but perhaps a low low speed chase, like in the, in the past, <laughs> uh, whatever, whatever, you know, whatever went wrong at that, at that mobile, at that mobile place. So I agree with you completely. I think it just, taking a moment, wrapping our heads around where the issue is and then moving forward. Yeah, I, and I like Rachel's comment about picking it apart into bite-sized pieces, starting with the definition, et cetera, so that we can have a seat at whatever table might already be set and the guests have already arrived. We just we don't might know be it. the last <laughs> to walk in. Well, I mean, I think that that actually, gift. defining what mobile is actually allows us to maybe look that could be step two. Like once we get it, we get our handle on what is a mobile clinic, then we can look at are we actually doing, as with current state law, are we actually doing enough? Are we doing the right thing? Does it, you know, that's care. yeah. And so that's that can be like step two because I, I agree. It's like we do have people who are doing things, and are we actually protecting our patients? Yeah. You know, you don't want to be perceived as we didn't bother to because it's it's going on. You know, yeah. Um, and so are we? We're not protecting those people. So right. step one, define it. Step two, then see how the laws are and go from there. And how we want to become integrated into that conversation. I think I have a stupid question. So is the gist of it that it's unambiguous as to whether or not it's legal for an optometrist to make a house call? No. It, no, is, no, it no. is currently illegal unless you're a nonprofit and associated with the school. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. To make a house call. Make house call. House call. Correct. That's not the only. That's not. There's a whole bunch of other. There's, there's a whole. There's a whole bunch. Yeah. That, that uh, is. That's just that your van. For an optometrist, yeah. if you're an ophthalmologist, you can. Yeah. But if you're an optometrist, you cannot make a house call on a private citizen in their own home. Which is another question because I thought I thought Kurt brought this up at the last meeting as well that I thought was fascinating is that. And correct me if I'm wrong, Kurt, if you're a doctor or an attorney, you have a personal license, is that what right. it's called? Yes. So you can do that. And right. maybe one option is to say, do we change the way, maybe you have a separate license for an optometrist if they want to pay a little bit extra money to have a license that would allow them to go into and do a house call. That, those, are, those are all ideas to put on the table to have a, a broader conversation where we can engage more stakeholders in the discussion. But there's a lot of different ways you can look at this um, that, again, it's for me, it's about access and making sure that people have access to optometric services, but making sure that we're <coughs> protecting them at the same time. So I think there's a lot of different ways to discuss it, and that's why having the first conversation about well, what is it and then what are we trying to accomplish is, the, is, in my opinion, the best first step to address this issue. Does all this arise out of our branch office statutes? Or am I on a different track? So there's <clears throat> two requirements that are kind of limiting any kind of mobile outreach, mobile clinics right now, and that includes the statement of licensure and the branch office license in that optometrists have to either obtain a statement of licensure or a branch office license, which would 
it's registered to a specific location. So they have to register that location when they're practicing with the board. And so if, if we do open it up to allow mobile clinics, the question comes in, okay, are, would there be an exemption for them to not have to register each location that they go to? Because if they are going to res residential homes, you don't want them to say, us to say, okay, you have to re register that patient's home on the website and so those are all things to consider. So it, it does have a linkage to that. Thank you. So to bring closure, perhaps a motion, I don't know if one's needed, for the mobile clinic work group to host a public meeting and invite members of the board. I think we just have a board. Right. Maybe a yeah, yeah either make it, okay. make it a, a specific single issue. issue. Yeah, single issue, or okay, it, it depends on what's... So does that need a motion? Okay. Can I... I don't think so. So would you... It's standalone board meeting, so time-wise, are you thinking between January and April? Are you thinking after sunset? Just so... Well, I mean, after... We logistically after RDO, speaking, <laughs> what, what are we looking at? Things. I mean, we have the RDO committee to... Right, we have. so... Can, so, but we can we can include this in the in the, in the um, strategic plan. Yeah. Yes. And then we can once it's in the strategic plan, then we can start addressing it, the details of it. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't mean that it can't be in peace. At least you can have a conversation about certain items. So the next board meeting also will have a heavy agenda, but that doesn't mean you can't bring it, you know, one piece of that forward. Like the definition. Like what is it, what is it, like that first definition? Discussion? Okay, that could take three hours. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, but I mean, we can you start out with it. You can do it in piecemeal, because if you, yes, you know, you can have, we've done this before, we would have like a single topic issue, um, or single topic meeting, but if you want to make it a little more productive, you could do a little, you know, a little lead work beforehand, because then, then the single topic meeting will go for you, you won't have it you won't have a, a good outcome you won't have a good production during the meeting so okay. little pieces are not that might do any other comments from board members on that any comments from the public yes. just just as a as a reminder some of this also spawned from katrina um, folks from texas had to go to louisiana and therefore this mobility issue was to deliver care in emergencies being in earthquake country so so i think from a, a perspective of a board is to find out what are all the pieces and prioritize because i think that that as you go through a legislative process you'll see that things get put in and put out that you want to maintain whatever your priority is based upon you know is it is it the protection because you don't want you know dock in the box in a, you know winnebago running around doing eye exams versus you're delivering care because it's access issues. Any other comments? Anyone? Okay. Agenda, oh. I, I'm sorry, Kurt. So, um, Madam President, members, is the direction then this item will be included in the board's strategic plan to be tackled at kind of a later date? Is that kind of what I understood? It's an ongoing. Ongoing, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Agenda item 15, review consideration of possible action on consumer protection committee recommendations regarding the scope of practice educational outreach. So members of the committee, you're the chair of this committee. Hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, before you is a letter, and I want to thank um, the board members, the committee members on this. Um, we're hoping that we can get this out before the end of the year. Um, this is kind of a putting it out on the radar to optometrists, what their uh, certification allows them, what their scope of practice is. Uh, so we did it kind of two form. One is kind of the, the, the chart you see on the front. And then we also uh, did the, the definitions on the back. In addition, we're gonna be, the staff will be adding some frequently asked questions onto the website in case folks have questions about anything using the medical boards frequently asked questions as an example. So we're asking for a motion to uh, to move forward in, in being able to mail this out to all licensed optometrists in the state. I'll, I'll you, that motion. you get a second? Second. Okay. So 
Um, any comments from any board members? Any questions for the committee? No, I, I like the letter. Um, I thought it was very easy to read, and especially the the table on the front. Mm -hmm. I like the table. Yeah. And just website. Yeah. Capital W small s. I had a, this is just a small suggestion. Um, as opposed to the X's and blanks, should we have it as yeses and no's just for additional clarity? I like that. I just, that's a minor. That's better, I think. Yeah, I like yeah. that's better. Because then it's very, yeah. it's like, no, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I had made a couple of comments when we had our last committee meeting on this. So the first point under certification, scope of practice. So conduct eye exams for overall healthy eyes and screen for disease. So if you have no certification, you really cannot do overall health of the eyes because you're unable to evaluate the, um, really anything with the medical fundus. And I had mentioned putting in a little asterisk to the something that says to the limits of uh, to the limits to the diagnostic limits of certification or so, something that that notes that no certification really cannot do an overall health of the eyes evaluation and the other comment i had made was just to make sure that um, staff verified that all of these statements were correct how would you change it what did I tell you, Joanne? What did I? I had good. I had good words when I talked to you. You remember? No. Okay. So if I can interject a little bit, I think that we had that conversation, and the way that it's worded was copy and paste from how the law reads. Okay. And so if the board wants to entertain the motion to move this forward and delegate authority for me to work with Kurt and make sure that it matches up with how the law reads and at the same time make those disclaimers, then we could do that as well prior to being moved up. If I can, I would make such a motion. And I would second. <laughs> so wait, we have one motion already on the okay. table. Um, you can either withdraw that motion or we can... Can we amend that motion? We can amend it. To allow the EO and council to review and modify as appropriate. Who made that motion? I made the motion. Do you accept this? I accept the amendment. All right. Who made the second? Who made the second? That's okay. Do you guys have a motion? I'll second the motion with a friendly amendment. All right. How's that? Any other comments? Who's on this committee? It's it's Rachel, Dr. Turetsky was on this. Trent, he wasn't an official. I added him. Mark Moore, uh, Mark Moore, Mark Moore, and Dr. McIntyre, right? Yeah. Do Do either of oh, you no, other I, committee members have something on it? And I was just asking because <laughs> yeah. there's not so many comments that are on the committee now. Um, <coughs> any other board members' questions for the committee? Any public comment? The public is spinning out. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So that would be the motion on the table. There's a second. We'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Rachel. Aye. Mark. Aye. Aye. Dr. McIntyre. Aye. Dr. Wong. Aye. Aye. I vote aye. Aye. Dr. Tresky. Aye. 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 Agenda item 16. That's Joanne. You're going to go through these. Uh, we're going to try going as quickly as possible, but we'll be uh, some more the action. But we're looking at A, this is the unprofessional conduct. Um, this has been submitted to OAL previously and was disapproved. It has had the changes and has been resubmitted to OAL for the deadline to hear back from them, I believe it's December 9th. So fingers crossed we'll be good to go on that one. Next one we're looking at B, the RDO fees. Um, this was put in place whenever we didn't know if the new fee structure was going to go through legislation. Um, we are actually doing a action requested on this, but the staff recommends the board vote to withdraw the rulemaking package. Um, it's no longer necessary. The maximum the regulations would put up to is below what the uh, ceiling 
the below the fee floor. So do you need a motion? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I so do. <laughs> I second. I second. So the motion members would be to withdraw, withdraw, withdraw this rulemaking package and prepare any necessary notifications for the Office of Administrative Law. Are you okay with that motion that you made? We haven't noticed it yet. We haven't yeah. noticed yet? No. Okay, never mind. Just to, so just, it's just to, to just withdraw, withdraw the I'm sorry. making package from Correct. the approved regulation. I thought we had noticed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. You need one of these expressive pillows. Yes, I do. <laughs> Throw, roll that over here. <laughs> Send it down. This is the motion that was the second. Um, any comments from any board members? Any comments from the public? I will call vote Rachel. Aye. Mark. Aye. Ruby. Aye. Dr. McIntyre. Aye. Dr. Long. Aye. 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 Next one, this is going to be the first of a few. Um, as we heard earlier from the message from DCA, there is a slight change into the regulation package, um, I guess, way we have to do it. Um, now, before we notice it, it has to go to DCA and then up the chain, and it has to be approved. So the packages that has been previously approved by the board that haven't been noticed yet, we need to have, uh, council will give an exact motion on that, but we need to have the board vote to have the staff send it up through the chain of command. Um, this one is looking at, this is the updated forms. further clarify we're we're what we would like is a motion regarding any previously approved language from the board to all be included in the motion so we're looking at language related to items C D E F G H I N J right so, so members this is oh, not, not D I'm sorry not D okay, just so kidding if, if you recall the what was advertised as brief but was a little bit longer DCA message that um, Ms. Sieverman read about the change in the process. The board has already approved this, this language. And what we're seeking here is with that approval, we need to go one addition, two additional steps. The first additional step is prepare the other documents associated with rulemaking, which would be the notice, the standard of reasons, and the fiscal 399 have that prepared and that gets sent to the director of the DCA and agency and then once they're okay with it once that approval then we set the met then the matter gets notice for publication of the office of administrative law previously those steps were necessary once we got the language approved we just go ahead and notice it the agency along with uh, other pieces of the chain of command have required that 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 now be run for them so it's not. It's not that the, we're not. We're not doing anything different. The board's not changing any language. We're just attempting to address a change in the procedure that is now associated with rulemaking. Do I have that right? Yeah. With a slight caveat, with oh. E, E was already agreed upon language from the board. They approved it, but then we had the law change that re right. also Sorry. requires the RDO pro the RDOs to also notify us and register the co-located settings. So you have before you uh, printed out for you during the break, the form and the proposed language has already been approved with, we made the minor tweaks to reflect the current law. So we would like the board to approve the tweak and move forward with the process. Yeah. Question. Um, so uh, on the form, yep. I know we don't have any say over, over ophthalmologists, but would we still have a an optician notify us if there was a co-location arrangement with an ophthalmologist currently the law is just if it's in a co-located setting with an optometrist and an rdo so it's the only time an optician has to notify us of anything correct okay i make the motion second it any other discussion by any board members so we're moving C, F, G, and H to prepare and notice, and then E, the same thing with tweaks. Yes. Okay. H, I, and J as well. H, okay. I, and J. Most of the alphabet, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Any 
Any other board member comments? Any comments from anybody in the public? So we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Rachel? Aye. Mark? Aye. Ruby? Aye. Dr. McIntyre? Aye. Dr. Wong? Aye. Aye. Dr. Aye. Dr. Aye. Dr. Aye. Dr. Aye. Aye. Dr. Aye. Aye. Does any, would anybody like a break or we just continue? Keep going. Okay. Uh, agenda item 10, strategic The sunset report. Um, so first, we'll get some comments from legal counsel, from the EO, and then we'll go with the board members. Kurt. Uh, sure. Um, my um, numbers is, I was the one that at the, at our most recent the teleconference meeting, I believe, on the 21st, I talked about you know, the, one of the things that the, that the board may want to be concerned about is governing or attempting to govern in the post-North post Carolina um, decision. And I just want to, a couple things, as the board goes forward, it may want to consider that whatever, whatever solution be part of, perhaps, you know, because obviously optometry wouldn't be the only board that would be affected. Every, every governing board like this would be. And to understand that with the composition of the board vis-a-vis uh, -vis public members uh, or non-public members, licensee members, um, may not be the solution, may not be a silver bullet, may not, may not be the panacea uh, to avoiding uh, any, any potential antitrust litigation. So those that are the only two comments that I had. I did want to the only thing that I was hoping to talk about was that in Section 11, when we did talk about the new, and I, pres and I presume that we would, there's kind of a, that there's a paragraph that references um, some, some that's something specific to the governor. I was, as your counsel, Page 102. I was, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I got my glasses on. As your counsel, since you're essentially sending this to a different branch of government, of the legislative branch, I, I don't know whether that I don't know whether that section uh, has any relevancy as the uh, as the legislative committee is consider the sunset report. So those are my those are my comments. Uh, all I would like to add, members, is at the prior board meeting. Actually, the first teleconference we had, the board had directed staff to show two different options when it came to the consumer satisfaction survey results. It asked to see option one, all the specific comments, and then option two, the summaries of the comments. So that's one thing that I would like the board to weigh in on if they would like to move forward with option one or option two. And the other thing, when it when we when we are done with all of the discussion and we have all the input from the members, if we could get a motion that you, the board delegates authority to me and to our legal counsel to take all of the feedback provided into the, and put it into the sunset and it make any non-substantive changes. So we're talking format changes, any grammatical changes, typos, so we don't have to keep bringing this back before the board in order to meet our deadline. So um, I'm just going to go, she will start with Donna Burke. Hmm, okay, let's see. Are we, just, are we going through the whole thing or just those two sections? Are we going like... I'm asking what you for any, in, on any, any comments because at the, the last, deal. yeah, the last okay. uh, conversation we had, people were okay with most of it. They had some sections. So if there's any, uh, okay. Yeah, you can, I mean, you can talk about anything you'd like. Um, are you going to do the new, my question, are you going to do the new issues separate? Like, do anything, or do you want to go into everything at one time? I was just going to have people make comments in general, and if, I, I have a feeling the new issues are going to be the biggest thing, so if, you know, just make the comments you need to, and then we can talk about the new issues in more detail. I don't think there's going to be too many other comments that come up. The only new issue, I think, that members, if I may, the only new issue that popped up uh, page 57 would be the home that I found it, where I think uh, given uh, Mr. Stephanopoulos's uh, talk on personnel uh, within the board, I, I think there was a comment or a general board consensus that there may want to be a revision in this section to the renewed emphasis of 
staff development and training. I thought the board members somehow wanted a statement that they wanted to recognize the endeavors of the current executive officer and her staff about uh, staff development and improvement. So. Okay. Um, I would like to make just a couple of comments on the new issues. Um, I really didn't have any additional upgrades for the parts that we had already covered um, since our last meeting. I, and my comments really just focus on the new issues in Section 11. And I had a question on basically what Kirk was just talking about on the board composition, um, whether it would make sense for us to include that in this report. Why would we do that? And then my other comment um, had to do with the uh, item under Economic Development A. And um, I, I think I understand the intent. It's just very vague. It didn't really tell me what it is that we, what it is we were trying to do. So those were my comments for the review. Um, Can you tell us what page you're referring to as far as the big comments? just towards this the the board composition that Kurt was referring to and I mean I understand where the idea would be of changing the composition of the board perhaps making it only um, public members and not professional members but at the, I, to me in some ways that sort of seems more of like a, a knee-jerk response to everything that's going on in North Carolina um, looking at our current board right now I think it's actually a really good representation of optometry, of public members, and it's a really good mix, and it's, in my opinion, it's it's a really good board for, for the protection of the consumers because we have so many different points of view, and I don't see how changing it, changing the composition significantly would, would, help, would help the public. So I'll just make um, some quick comments and topic was brought up. I also, I mean, it says in light of whoever made the suggestion, in light of the United States Supreme Court's North Carolina decision, so changing the board composition again, as Kurt mentioned, doesn't do anything. The legislature, the Attorney General, DCA, DCA Legal, nobody has used that as a, um, uh, a fix for any of that, nor do I think it does it fix that. And same thing that Dr. Wong is commenting on, um, by having, you know, we have a minority member, a minority number of optometrists on the board. We also have a minority, of, you know, there's not, there's one optician, there's five optometrists. So that's not a majority um, of any profession on the board as it is. And I don't see how this would help actually not having, we have somebody who on this board works in a hospital, somebody who works at a university, private practice, somebody who provides uh, skilled nursing facility care. I think those are, we've had, you know, other, we had used to have uh, Dr. Giardina who worked in a public health setting. I think those are all valuable things to have here. And quite frankly, almost everything we talk about touches um, on something that you would need. So oh, we have a corporate setting individual as well. So we, everything we discuss touches something that an optometrist would comment on. So just having a, I don't see how this is, a, is helpful. Um, also, one thing that I feel that you know, doing that, this sort of somehow implies that we're not taking 
the public into consideration. And that is actually the sole purpose of this board, regardless of who's, of who's sitting on that. So this statement implies that that's what we're not doing. Um, if a public member actually said this, I'm, I would like to know why you think that we're not doing that already. If a optometrist suggested that, I would wonder why, what you think your role is on the board, because that's what I understand my role to be, is to protect my patients. And quite frankly, yes. I'm the one who made that suggestion. Okay, so um, I'll just make the comment in general is that when, regardless of whether I sit on the board or don't sit on the board, patient care and patient advocacy is what we have to do. Anybody who, who is not an optometrist, the minute they step off the board, they're resp if they never want to think about how patients receive care, the, the best interest of a patient that seeks optometric care, you don't have to think about it ever again once your commission ends. I have to think about it for the rest of my life. And that's what I felt the point of having an optometrist on the board, any optometrist or an optician, that I, think I felt that was the reason for having them there to begin with. So. I'd love to give you my rationale on that. Can I ask, make a procedural point? Mm -hmm. I mean, this seems like a huge issue. I'm not sure the board has a position on this particular point, and I don't think it's a good idea to, to take the position on for the first time in the Sunset Report. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do we want to debate this issue in the context of Sunset Report, of the Sunset Report? And maybe it's a discussion that should be tabled for later. Yeah, I don't think I just don't feel it belongs there. Because you're you're saying that in light of the Supreme Court decision, nobody feels that that's actually going to fix the issue. Nobody else is proposing it, including the legislature, including DCA legal, including the AG who spearheaded this whole discussion to begin with. So to put it here doesn't make any sense to me. I won't give you my rationale. Mm -hmm. I, you can. Okay, get off the, if you don't think it's appropriate, we won't go into it. But I. Actually, I'm going to go into it anyway. Um, I, I, we've been talking about a few things. Um, specifically, there was uh, non-traditional forms of refractions, online refractions, things on that order, where the committee that was dealing with this was pretty much hamstrung and couldn't do what I feel was important to protect the public because there was a fear that it would result in a potential North Carolina issue. So to your comment, I don't think we're able to do our jobs appropriately as members of the profession the way that this board is currently constituted until the North Carolina issue is settled. Uh, there have been other issues that have come up where we have been advised indirectly by council that eh, you probably shouldn't get, delve into that. Um, those issues do have a consumer protection aspect to them. If it was necessary to make this board you know, pretty much all members of the public or maybe this with two professional members on it and that would allow this board to actually do their job, great, I'm all for it and that's my purpose for that because I don't think we've been allowed to do our job because there's, a, there's an overriding fear that there's going to be a, uh, a North Carolina challenge on something that we do. So either, you know, we don't do our job and we let things fall by the wayside or we take some action that might allow us to actually do what we need to do. Again, and I agree with Dr. Wong's comment that it's more of a knee-jerk reaction. And I think the North Carolina case had like kind of a, a shock, you know, value to it. And I think as people kind of, as it moves on, I think it's not necessarily going to be that same issue. I mean, we can see it. Again, I just don't feel it belongs here. Well, that shock has already resulted in, in issues that have not been able to be dealt with. I still stand by. I don't think it belongs in the sense of the comments. So I have a comment. So I, I kind of agree. I mean, there have been a number of occasions where we've wanted to do something for, I know, online refractions. We wanted to do some, I know you can't, North Carolina. So I kind of feel like people are speaking out of two sides of their mouth. When we want to try to do something, we can't because of North Carolina, and now we want to try something different, and we can't because it's a knee, it's it's a knee jerk reaction. Number one, number two, there is legislators who are interested in changing the makeup of the board because of the North Carolina. I, I've already I've had conversations, so there are there is a huge movement. There's a gentleman who is advocating this for all consumer boards that the makeup of the board be changed. So. This is an issue that's going to come up. I think that putting it in the report, it doesn't mean that we're doing, we're not introducing legislation, we're not doing anything in it now, but at least it shows that we are at least aware that there is 
an issue pertaining to the makeup of these boards in terms of, and it's not just our board, it is a number of different boards, and we again could be on the on the forefront of addressing this issue. And, and I agree with Dr. Turetsky. I mean, I think that having a smaller percentage of licensees to offer input and support, but we're a consumer board. And sometimes I do feel like the public's voice isn't heard because the, the licensees, it is their livelihood, and I understand that. And I just, I agree. I, I, I think it should be included in the report. Maybe we can rewrite it in a different way, but I do think it's an issue that it's not, it is gonna come up. I, I know it's gonna come up. And we can either say, hey, we're aware of it, and we put it in our review, so it's something to consider, or we can, you know, wait until it, again, the, the horse leaves the stable and we're just playing catch up. I don't think it does any harm in putting it in a sunset review report. At least says we're, we're addressing and looking at this issue. It's not gonna change anything, and it still has to go through a legislative process and be signed by a governor. So, but again, it at least says that, hey, it's something we're considering. Just like online refractions. We have zero jurisdiction right now over online refractions. It's ophthalmologists who are doing it, not opt, um, I can't think optometrists. Of optometrists, I'm like, where am I? <laughs> um, but yet that's in the report because we know that that's an issue that's important and we know we're gonna be asked about it. So again, what is the harm in putting something in there, especially if it's something that one of our colleagues on the board feels strongly about? I mean, if we, have, we haven't had enough, I agree with Mark's comments, you know, it's something to discuss. I have to go testify for this thing. I don't feel comfortable. I don't know, Donna would be coming with me, maybe Lily, and if one of us can't go, are you guys comfortable with it? Not on that issue. Well, Simply we because, on it, I mean, on the re online refractions, we've had discussions about that. This board has not discussed the board composition change, and stating that we'd like to consider a different composition of the board is not accurate. Well, we haven't even voted on it. We haven't even discussed well, it. I know, but again, I guess if we're just the same way that you commented earlier that like throwing in a topic where no one's made a discussion. But are we no discussing had, it now? I don't think it's enough to, you know, I don't think it's, I think it's a little bit too, just throwing it in there out of nowhere. As you commented on previous issues, you could make the same argument before, aren't we discussing it now? But I don't feel comfortable with it. Well, we still have a, almost a month before this is due for the legislature. I mean, I just, I, I just thought this was supposed to be a, a report that we all vote on and we agree on. If we vote on it and it goes down, fine. But to say that the three of you aren't going to support it because you're not comfortable doing it makes me wonder if our voices are going to be heard as a board. I didn't say it was just the three of us. I just said we have to go testify. Oh, I, I understand. So I, that's my opinion. I just would like to, you know, I, I would assume that every item would get voted on. It could be voted yes or no. and. That's just my opinion. I'm only one voice. Other people get to vote on it. But I think it should be at least considered. And if people want to vote it down, it gets voted down. But to just not have a vote on it by board members, because we haven't had enough discussion. Well, yeah. I, thought, I thought that was the purpose of today, is we're going through the new items. We vote. Yeah. And so, then, okay, so, so why so. don't we vote? But sure. that's not what just transpired. So that, that's what I thought, too. I thought every item goes through here and we vote yes or no, and it is either in or out. Right. And I gave my comments. I, I agree with Dr. Turetsky, and I, I hope that we can vote on it. You want to vote on this one topic right now? Well, I thought we're going to vote on I all of it. Yeah, we're going to yeah. go through all of them. So are you asking to vote? You just said vote on individual topics one by one. Or do you well, want I don't understand. Okay. Are we voting on as it is right now, everything that's in here, or are we going through each of these items and take, and you could take stuff out if you don't want it in the sunset review report? Well, that's what I was just saying, is that I'm not comfortable with it in the report, and then you said take a vote on it. But shouldn't we all vote and agree what's in the report? Eventually. 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 Right well, now we're I'm, just, I'm, let me make a suggestion. Session. Let's throw all our comments out there. There may be some comments that are, um, are deal breakers, I'll call them, okay? Deal breakers, and we can set those comments, or some text that may be deal breakers for people. We can set those comments aside and have individual votes on those. 
I think we'll have a sense as to what those deal breakers are, and we can vote on those. But if there are other comments that are kind of like, oh yeah, that sounds like a good idea, we can just move yeah. forward on those. Well. Rather than having kind of an up and down vote on the whole, on the whole report. That's my procedural suggestion. Okay. So I think we stopped here with me going through with the pieces that, and those were the comments I had on those too. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And so okay. Dr. Wong, then I made my comments, Dr. McIntyre. I guess putting the board composition paragraph in there, it kind of, it's almost highlighting it like this is something we're concerned about in our board. It, and again, we haven't had that much of a discussion on it. And, I, I keep going back and forth, and I hear both sides of it. I'm like, oh, Rachel has a good point. Oh, mm -hmm. this is a good point. But I guess it comes down to, I don't want to point out a potential problem if we don't think there's one. I don't want to alert somebody to something. Um, moving on beyond that, I can talk about anything, right? Yeah. Um, a couple of the other new issues, I think, were just expansions upon previous new issues. For example. You have access to quality eye care with mobile clinics underneath that, and then you discuss mobile clinics again on page 103. Is there any way to pull that in under access to quality eye care? Um, there was foreign graduate sponsorship for the NBEO examination. Is that, does that have something to do with professional and technical excellence. So are, are we repeating ourselves a couple of times here, or is there some way to? Yeah. Consolidate. Yeah, thank you. Consolidate it. It just seems like we reviewed it a couple of times in under different categories, but yet they were the same categories. And actually, is that it, Dr. McIntyre, or anything else? You, not, not at this point. I'm just having, I'm just making sure I'm looking at the the divisions properly and I haven't misread how this is laid out. I did have one more comment. Um, some of the, the things that were put in here, I like the kind of flavor or intent behind them, but some of the wording is kind of vague. So, for example, under Section 11 where it says access to quality eye care, if you write something like understand the future role of mobile clinics, um, it's kind of, we're, you're going to say, okay, yes, we understand. Right? There's no like specific, there's less ownership on something where you word it that way. So if there's a different way to word some of these things, that's just one example. There's another example where, um, you know, develop a better understanding of new business models. It's kind of like, okay, but what do we, can we make that more of like a, a focus? where there's like a, as opposed to, yes, we understand. Yes, we develop an understanding. Because it's like, did you do anything with what's in here? Um, and so again, the spirit of what's written in here, I like that. I just, the way that it's worded somewhere where there could be a little bit more, um, like as an example for inspection authority. Again, you don't have to keep this topic if you don't like it, but the way that it says, therefore the board would like the statute, it gives a very specific targeted goal as opposed to just saying vaguely, well, I understand or I don't understand. You know, we, we have an understanding. We developed, you know, it doesn't give us any kind of a, an ownership or accountability to have to do something other than say, yes, we understand. So if there's a way to kind of reword some of those. Um, okay, so there's, I mean, there's a few of them, right? You see like the kind of the pattern in some of these. Like I, I don't dislike the, the things that are in there. I just the way that they're worded if there's better. Like if we're going to assess technological, like what are we going to do with that? You know, what's the end game with that? Put more of that. I guess my comment to some of the vague wording is, I think part of it is we don't know how that will unravel in the next four years. And yeah. So like the mobile clinics, the language is vague because we quite frankly don't have a definition. So mm -hmm. part of what we're trying to do is actually understand what a mobile clinic is. And I mean, how it will function. Just make it a little bit more, you know what I mean? I, I understand. So, you can, so I, I'm, I just want to point out that it's not that um, this board is not fully considering all of these new issues and, and are not committed to following through on these oh, no, issues. I know that. I, I just want to make sure yeah. that we're yeah, all on the same page. But when, you know, the mobile clinics, we just had a conversation about the fact that we mm -hmm. really 
are at a loss to what that topic even is. So, so if, we could, if we could put some of those things, that would be better as opposed to, because if, if someone asks, what do you mean by understand, you know, it's just like, if we could just put a little bit more, maybe um, something, like, you know. I agree with that comment. I mean, some of these things are vague, uncertain, because we are still vague and uncertain. We are vague and uncertain. Yeah. And, and so and it, it's okay. The, and it is okay. And one of the things that the consultants made clear um, at the end of our last teleconference was these are, they want to make sure that this board is forward thinking, that we are considering the consumer protection, and that we have some things that we're really considering in the next four years before the next sunset report. They are not going to, as they laughed and said, we're not going to flog you okay. if you do not complete every single thing. We want to see you moving forward. We want to see you advancing. And mobile clinics, I have a feeling, is going to take they may years. Yeah, I, maybe. They I don't know. Um, but maybe tighten them up a little bit, but it does, I mean, we are vague and uncertain. No, right, but there's, I think that there's a, a few too many of it, you know, because we need a little bit more. So it's, they're gonna ask questions, so. <laughs> so as long as you're testifying, you'd like to know? I'd like to know. <laughs> so just a little bit more, you know, if, if we could just review those. Because um, I don't want to say that we were vague on purpose, because, I mean, some of that's true. Right. But I feel like, a lot of because the we're at the front end. We're at the front yeah, end. Some of those things, yeah. yeah. Well, and maybe, maybe what we say about mobile clinics, for example, is yeah. develop an understanding of mobile clinics and the pop and yeah. maybe, I mean, that maybe that's just the first sentence. Yeah. Because there are mobile clinics and they are operating, so it's not that. Like, so for example, this wonder under technology, like that is like vague, but it's like more. Um, Substantive in collaboration with other DCA boards about it's like you didn't write just evaluate online kiosk refractions uh, and kiosk refraction practices, use it and determine next, you know, something like that. Okay. So there would be a little bit more of a yes, we're going to do this with it, yes, we're yes, we don't understand it, but yes, we're going to go here with it, right? So that's a good example of it's vague and it's broad, but it's directed to that's. Um, instead of using or in addition to using the term mobile clinic, um, like our group, we we say we we are we have port we are portable. We can have portable on site eye examinations, and that sort of gets rid of that one. It, it just gets rid of that idea of a big old van pulling up in front of your house. Or so I meant mobile slash portable, portable instead of mobile. But just just a slightly change, slight change in the wording. That's fine. So that was my other comment. Um, Dr. McIntyre, you were like, okay. any more comments? Okay. okay, Ruby, any more comments? No yeah. comments. Uh, Mark. Um, yes. So um, on the survey, uh, I haven't decided whether we want to have all the comments or the summary. But when we talk about the survey, I, I think we do need to be a little bit stronger about how few responses we get. I know Jessica's going to check um, um, the surveys and make a comparison with the amount of contact our organization gets. But another way of, of expressing the low um, response rate is to say something like, and we received only an average of five responses a year, or, or, or something like that, right? Take an average of how many responses we got. And you know, in, indeed, as in, in blank here, we only got nine responses, right? So to have that as an introductory paragraph to show how how few responses we got. Um, I had a question um, that I asked. I'm not sure I got the answer to it. Could could is it legal for the optometry fund to to subsidize the RDO um, operations? Sorry, is it legal? Is it legal? Like if 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 the uh, RDO fund is at a deficit. Oh. And the budget people explain that in their process they do the a charge back. Okay. So they will so take into account, account yeah. right? They'll take into account the time that uh, Jessica spent, and then reverse the funds. To, to the RDO. Right. To right. Off. But the RDO won't have the money to pay for it. it, it so it's a, a temporary yet. loan? Not yet. So, so it's okay. 
All right, so on the books, it's a, it's a... It's a negative. It's a negative, okay. And Mark, that, your concern was taken in the, in the newest version, November 1st, that statement that you had a concern about was removed from the version. Okay. So it's no longer included in there for that concern. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm not sure I have the right page numbers, but in the enforcement discussion on formal discipline, uh, the, the numbers are not good, where we're, we have an expectation of 365 days to do a certain thing, and the, uh, the, the actuals are like 100, 1,200 days um, or 800 days. Uh, we, we need to put an explanation as to why that is the case. The executive director has given me a very good explanation, um, but that needs to be included in the report. Um, uh, page 83 on the version I looked at, regarding um, statute of limitations. Um, that, I think it's statute of limitations. When I read that explanation as to why the statute of limitations forced us to close cases, th that explanation still does not, um, um, it, 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 it doesn't, it, I don't understand it. Um, oh, it's because you're closing the cases because they... I, I know that, but if I'm a legislator, I'm thinking, well, you guys blew it. Um, let's see, not through the case. Oh, um, so uh, under the 38 optometry have been closed due to the statute of limitations, many of which related to incidents occurring over seven years from the incident date. That, I don't understand what that clause says. So if, if you can clarify it when you're, it, 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 it just doesn't make any sense. Um, there's a statement in the uh, Sunset Report that the board cannot settle a case pre-accusation. Is that really true? We can't yes. settle. We, so if, if if I'm an accused optometrist and I say, "Can we cut a deal? I'm willing to negotiate this case and come to a resolution," is our response, "No, we have to send it to the attorney general, and they have to write up this accusation, this legal document, file it, and then we can talk settlement with you." Yes. Okay. I, I, the only the only twist would be if for some reason you switch the enforcement mechanism, perhaps try to issue a citation. That may happen, but the reason for that is number one, I don't I don't know what how we would attach attach a settlement decision or a consent degree, a plea bargain, whatever you call it, where there's no formal there's no formal charging document, and the formal charging document obviously is what starts the process. So. While well, the medical board has a specific statute that says they can issue a public approval or a letter of reprimand, essentially post-investigation, but pre-accusation, this board does not have that statutory scheme. So once the accusation is filed, then settlement can occur. Thank you. I'd like to raise this as a topic of discussion for the a future meeting, because if we can settle cases pre-accusation, then we're going to reduce a lot of attorney general costs, right? Because in, in order, uh, I think, right? Is, does, this, does the attorney general write our, does the attorney general write our accusations or do, do we write our accusations? The, the attorney general would write them. Writes the accusations. Correct. Okay, so if we can settle our cases before they go to accusation, we're gonna say, save a ton of attorney general fees. Um, in the administrative agency I used to work at, we, we rarely had accusations because we got so many settlements before accusation. Um, and then on last, my last comment is on the composition of the board. It, it, it seems like such a, 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 an important issue with lots of discussion. I, I, I can't, I, I don't think this board can make the statement that we're considering a different composition. Mr. Longoni, if I may, um, let, me just, let me just ask this. So, as I've said, I think in some emails, is that this is really a, this is a board product, right? Right. This is, this is a board product. 
So in some ways, it's, it's as, as if, I know that Dr. Chawler and Ms. Burke or something going to testify, but it's, it's, it's as if this board is testifying on paper. So my presumption is, is that the board would want to make sure the board collectively after taking a vote or whatever that everything that's in that report it, it means what it says and it says what it means and so if the board hasn't considered changing the composition which I don't know if they have or not then that statement if it if they haven't then that statement ought not be in there because it's not true if the situ if the situation is the board seeks you know seeks uh, you know further guidance from the legislature about how to effectively govern post North Carolina, you know, the North post North Carolina world. That may be something. Um, so I just want to reflect that. Like I said, if, I, 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 and that's where I, kind of where I'm coming from, right? right? And I'm not sure we're ready to have that to, for the board to make that decision today. Um, I mean, as a compromise, if if the statement is something like some board members want to consider. You know, well, I just I'm okay with it, but as as a statement of the board, I, I haven't thought about it. We haven't discussed it long enough, and it's a longer discussion. So, well, just uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying a, a statement of my position. No, I understand. I'm, as your attorney, I'm suggesting if I were a legislature and I read that, my natural inference would be, oh, so the board wants to consider changing its composition, because that's sort of the plain meaning of that sentence. So, if that's not if that's not what the board has considered that I would respectfully suggest as your attorney that that the board could say yes we've just considered it and we put that statement in or we, we haven't really considered it or some other thing so if it needs to be wordsmith that's fine you know whatever I just want to make sure is I'm not on the merits because I'm not a board member just I want to emphasize those statements in there because if the if a, if a board member a testifier or some it's very likely that um, you know when you're talking about the children's vision or mobile clinics or some other thing, a legislator and a respective committee or on the floor could say, "Hey, what about what about this thing? You know, are we also changing the composition as we talked about children's vision or whatever?" And so I would want to make sure that to the best extent we can that that statement is in fact reflective of what the board has done. Uh, I have no further comment. I have a question for Mark. Yes. So one of the first comments that you had made was around enforcement. Yes. So if you could take a look at the top of page 75, do you not feel that that is a strong enough explanation of our enforcement situation? Um, page 75. Is that wrong? Yeah. 75. Are you saying the It's the question that says explain transit enforcement data. That's oh, 76. 76. Right there? Yeah. There we go. There it is. <laughs> um, Doctor, I, I don't think that responds adequately. I did read that section. I think the explanation should be there, but. You know, it, it's an overall discussion of where kind of we, we lost, uh, we had staff promotions, staff problems in, in, in 2015, 2016, et cetera. Some of these off the charts delays are in other years. Um, and and th there, there are good reasons for them, but we should address them head on. So what I would like to do is, is take his comments and we can provide we can call out the ones who are the outliers and provide an explanation of why they are outliers and then all the mitigating steps that we've taken since then to make sure that it doesn't happen again. I have a question. Under um, schools that are uh, under approval mm -hmm. on page uh, 69, I know this has to do with optometry schools. And I guess maybe in the future the sunset report would be uh, reviewed again because there are um, already schools, there are certification schools for opticians and I know now that we're under the uh, board of we'd want to consider those schools as well. Uh, there is a school, it's in the process of being uh, approved for opticians, it's actually a degree program at Moore Park Community College. 
which will open up next year, fall of 2017. So I guess you may be um, premature again, and we'd have to wait until that happens and then right. possibly get involved in that approval process. Right, so if, if all of that is clarified in the statute about the approvals of schools and how the board is gonna, if the board is going to undertake that, then in the next sunset, if this question were to come up, then we can include that as part of this. But right now, since it's not actually happening, then it would be, I think, premature to include that in the section. And then the sunset report is comes up every year? Or is four it years. Every four years. Hopefully, I mean, okay. there's extenuous circumstances that the legislature has made a shorter time frame if they want to check in sooner. But for the most part, it's four years. But the last sunset, it was 2012, and it covered actually a 10-year period. <laughs> So it covered 2002 to 2012. That shouldn't happen, and so I think it's safe to expect another sunset round in four years. So, um, so first, uh, on the comment section, I don't really have an opinion. I mean, whatever you, the staff decides the best way to put that information forward. And my understanding though is when we had someone on staff on the call from the committee, they preferred more detailed comments. So if that's what the staff requested, I would strongly suggest that's probably what we do. So, you know, not the condensed version. So I, I believe the, the individual who made the comment from the from this the assembly side who was in the meeting what he had clarified is that it's not uncommon in fact most of the boards do list the specifics but he, they would be open to the summaries as well so he kind of left it up to the board to decide what they want to do but let us know that it wasn't uncommon to list the specific comments well I think it was going before the elected officials Sometimes more information is better because they may come back and you might as well put it in there for them to not come back and say, well, where I want to see the, the specific comment. So, I mean, if it's, if you already have the work done, you might as well just include it in there. That's just my comment on that. Um, on the new issues, I'm just a little, I, I agree with Deborah. I mean, it's kind of hard to, to read this thing because it, it wasn't really combined. And so we, I think it's what, they're two very different styles of, presenting the facts so are we going with the bullet point with the or are we going with these more because that that says a lot I mean this is you know it's just it's really hard to kind of grasp when you're going back and forth between the two different uh, writing styles in this document um, I personally think that um, the first section is cleaner I, I agree I don't know that you need to include the stuff from the Brown administration um, you know, you could take that out, but you know, if we're going to do that, then you need to, if you're going to keep the National Practitioner's Database in there as an item, it should be a bullet point. Then either condense that to a bullet point or change the other bullet points to more sentence structure. Um, I do agree with Dr. Turetsky regarding um, not calling it a mobile clinic because I, you know, we don't really know what that is. Um, and so I think making that change is important. And you know, you know, as much as we'd like to think this will be the most important thing facing the state legislature next year, it, it's probably not. And so I think that making sure that we, we allow ourself, ourselves wiggle room to look at the different aspects that will come before us in the next four years, I think is important. So I, I'm more for being broader in what we're looking at than trying to be more specific and box ourselves in on different issues um, so you know those are kind of my you know my comments I, I, I mean I think we, there are a lot of issues in these in these new issue section that I just think it we just I don't even know what the issues are in this whole thing because you've got the database you've got inspection and then up here you've got economic development technology I think having a broader discussion of what even we want to have in there first before we get into the details because you can't, it's really hard to understand 
how this is going to be presented to the committee. So, uh, there, there, was a, there was a comment by us as a board uh, complimenting our managers uh, around development of staff. And so I came up with a suggested comment to add to the beginning of describe the board staff's development efforts and how much is spent annually on staff development. What page? Okay, so oh, I put the comment on the old version, you don't write the new version. Okay, so I wrote it down. It's a whole area. That's why I said the question. What kind of page are you on? Do a word search for describe the board staff development efforts. I'm around page 55, probably. There you go. There, you go. Uh, there it is. Okay, so my suggested ad, first sentence would be, the board is especially pleased with the leadership actions taken by the current executive officer, Jessica Seferman, and assistant executive officer, Robert Stephanopoulos, related to improvements in staff development. And then go on with the what's rest. described. And keep it in italic like you have it so it stands out as commentary from the board. Um, as far as... You'll email it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, as far as um, the option, the two options, it was my original suggestion to consider the summary. And, and the reason I suggested it originally was as I read the details of some of the comments, they were very individualized and in some cases not based on fact of how things actually work. And in some cases, I believe that there were mistakes by those that were being served of not processing through things correctly. So I felt that it was possibly a mis misrepresentation of the actions going on by staff because of lack of understanding of those making comments. So I would be in so support of option two. Um, as far as the comment uh, suggested by Dr. Turetsky around North Carolina, we haven't had the discussion about it. I do think it's an important topic. I think if we are going to include it, it needs to be in that light. It's been something that we've been discussing. It's something that council has brought to us. Um, so we are aware of it. We've not made any decisions as a board. So I'm not opposed to there being something in there about it, but going back to our whole conversation about being specific or vague, in some case, in this particular case, I believe it's okay to leave it, but leave it where it's vague. I would like to thank staff for including feedback that we've been giving in previous conversations because I could see quite a few changes that were made. So I appreciate that. And you're looking at the older version. Imagine <laughs> 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 if you read the current one. The new one is even better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dr. Shea, you walked right into that one. <laughs> but thank I you. I mean, thank you. <laughs> But staff has even done more work since then. I was like, wow, that was like really. <laughs> so the sequel is better than the original? Yeah, yeah. it's even better. Okay, well, good. I'm sure it is. I think that's all my comments, actually, for right now. Okay, so uh, under the access to quality eye care, perhaps it could read under B, develop an understanding of the future role of mobile slash portable clinics. I will send this to you. Perhaps instead of economic development, we could consider new or emerging businesses in optometric care. And A is clarified with an ending of and how consumer protection may be impacted. The, the idea here is to show that we're open to the future, 
we need to understand the future and what does the future mean from the perspective of consumer to your point and to the perspective of and how consumer impact protection may be impacted. Else did I rewrite it? My can you reread your economic development? Example? Sure. To instead of economic development, change the title to new or emerging businesses in optometric care. The ending of A after seeking entry to the California marketplace and how consumer protection may be impacted. What about doing business models? Instead I was going to say the word businesses. Yeah, businesses, but business models. Because there's different business oh, models. Or, do, or yeah. Or no. emerging business models. Having on a different copy here. And the Brown administration accomplishments, that was just for Jessica, too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What the context was, I didn't mean for it to end up in. Okay. It was just a note to you. Okay. It was in my I just did it. I didn't put it in my publisher. email. I put it in my email to the members. I didn't, wasn't sure if that it was included in the it motion just, or not. No, it was so. just to Jessica to say some of these were created based on Brown and what his focus is to the future since we are appealing our case to the Brown administration. So I'm hearing to remove it. It needs to be removed. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Jessica thing. It was on the handout, so I thought it was. Right, yes. <laughs> Got it, I'm removing. clarification from the board on, on going forward. Am I hearing that you would like to integrate the more specific into the uh, first five options? We can do that and work with legal counsel to ensure that it captures all of that. So that's one question. The other one is if you guys want to take a vote of whether or not to keep board composition in there or delegate authority for me to work with legal counsel to make it more vague. And then the other one is the consumer satisfaction survey results because it sounds like there's a, some differing in opinions and I'd like to know exactly what the board would like in the report. So those are the, the three questions to consider in a motion. I think there's a fourth one is do you want to see this again? Does the board want to see oh, this yeah. again? While we go through each of those three topics and vote, let's log them out. Okay, so the, the first question was how you would like the new issues laid out in the sunset report. Would you like us to work with legal counsel to integrate all the specifics into the the broader topics? So into the bullet points. Correct. You remove the other ones there or make them stay alive. Yeah. Are you saying like changing format or moving them? Moving them into the broader topics. So take the bullet I mean, points up. So no. what are the broad topics? Make them it match. So see where, it match. Right, where it so says. Pick one style. Yeah. Well, no, I think what she's asking is like the part that says, for example, national credit, you know, data bank, and the rest of them. Do you want to make them bullet points like the other ones ahead of them, or do you want to just integrate them maybe into these other categories if they fit? That's if that's. You the, integrate. It would need to be in a similar writing style. Yes. That's what you're saying. Yes. I mean, either way, it kind of has to be in a similar writing style, so it should be. I think that that's a fair point. So, so I don't bullets know. keep it vague enough so that in the next four years we can go with the flow and um, hopefully accomplish things that fit in that. If we start saying we're going to do six and twelve and two, we're going to be graded against six and twelve and two. <coughs> so then, here's a question for you. Yes. As author of the Baker. Yes. Just because I had to stand up in similar settings to justify existence, and it's always. Do, I mean, do you want to tackle the 
I mean, I hate to ask you. I'm would sorry. You, would you like to tackle that? It's a. I mean, would you like them to tackle? How, how should we do it? Because it's your. I don't want to change the intent of your work with, work with legal honest. counsel and try to make it. Yeah. Throw me in the mix. Okay. okay. Are we okay with that? Do we have to do a vote? But then the also to have the board review final document, etc. Well, we have to. That was yeah. the fourth yeah. question. I mean, yeah. if we're going to change anything, we sort of have to review it. Please. Um, so we'll have another board meeting prior to this then. I don't know do you the, have to have a board meeting or you can it just be like no. you're getting those? Unless you delegate authority. So if you email comments back to you. Right, but then you would want the board to say yes, this is it, or delegate authority to me and to Kurt to just whatever comments we get, put them in there without the board seeing it again. Wow. I mean what or well, can't we have something in between where, like, if you put the, let's say you change this around, right? Like, you guys get feedback from Sid, you change it around. We don't, and you send it out to everybody, right? Because it's just a few sections that we have to look yeah. at. So, let's say this section, everybody's okay with how it's worded, like minor, like minuscule changes. Do we have to reconvene again and say that? Can't we just email back, like we do when we're voting, that yes, we accept it? No, we don't accept it, or we want further discussion. Um, to respectfully, no. Okay. Well, just try it. When so you how about? <laughs> so here's a suggestion. Though. So let's say that you rework. Let's. I'm talking about this section because this is the big piece of it, right? So if you rework it and people are pretty much happy with it, like whatever minor changes they email that back to you, we could have hold like a really quick because at that point you've already. Everyone said whatever they had to do, and you could let us know, like if there needs to be a bigger, broader conference about it. But then it's a quick conference call to just approve, right? Is it a ten-day notice or going to sort of suggestion? Um, I'm not giving up on Sid's suggestion yet. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I envision whoever's going to do the redraft of this section does the redraft, sends it to the board members. The board members can send back. I would think to Jessica their comments. If, if, the, if, if our comments are like put a period here, put a comma there, I would give Jessica the authority to go forward on it. If Jessica sees that Sid says yellow and Mark says green and there's a substantive <laughs> disagreement, then we would have to call a meeting to Don't decide. Don't we agree on purple? Yeah, 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 yeah I, I want purple. purple. <laughs> Then we have to call a meeting to resolve that dispute, but otherwise we would have to give Jessica the authority to go forward. That's where Kurt is saying that no. Right, so members, here's the thing. Anytime we have a collective decision, that collective decision has to happen at the board meeting. So if the board says, hey, even on one simple paragraph, that looks good, that happens at a board meeting. It can happen at a board teleconference meeting, but it still has to happen at a board meeting. So anytime there's a collective discussion, deliberation, or action, that happens in a board meeting. So the run-up could be Jessica could, could make her changes, okay, send it out to the board members, the board members study that, right, and then we have the board meeting 24, 36 hours later, after 10 days notice, to make the decision. Hopefully it'll be refined enough. But I really can't, as your attorney, countenance any suggestion that we collectively make a decision about whether or not it needs to be in the app because that happens at a board meeting. So to the extent we have them remotely through technology, that's fine. To the extent it's a you know the sequel to all sitting here, that's fine as well. But it's gotta happen at a board meeting. I mean, so let, let me make one final run. <laughs> <laughs> so the authors right. send out the um, uh, changes. Right. Well actually at this board meeting right now, we give Jessica the authority to go forward. The Jessica will send out comments. What are we, what are we giving you the authority to go forward? To rewrite it. To rewrite it. Okay. She sends it out to us. We will give her comments. If Jessica decides she wants to have a meeting before she acts, she can call a meeting or she can suggest we have a meeting. If she doesn't think we need to have a meeting, she can go forward. Okay, well, so. Well, but you, you have to delegate that authority to Jessica. Yes, I'm Tuesday just. Tuesday. <laughs> 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 right. I 
I just think we commit to, if we want to see it again, we commit to getting on a call and knocking it oh, out real fast. All right. I mean, I if mean, it's just that be... one section, then okay. knock it out. Be, I mean, I don't think that if it, if it is a call, that it's going to be that <laughs> long of a discussion we've already okay. had. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Do we still need to go through each of the other little sub things that we need to decide? I withdraw my suggestion <laughs> based on my <laughs> <we> counsel. <laughs> So All right, let's, so let's move on. for this particular section, we're going to try to reword it so the wording is, the style is the same, right? The style is the same, and you'll send that out to everyone to review. And we'll schedule a teleconference. And you're taking out the brown. <coughs> that was going to be it's gone. Right? <laughs> it's gone already. It's already done. Okay. So the other one I would like the board to opine on is the format of how we display the specific comments or the summary of the comments in the customer satisfaction survey results. Let's just go down the road, right? We can do that. Or we can go ahead. Find more. No, no, we can, no, just give your, give your, <laughs> all, yeah. I'm sorry, what did you so say? When you say all, you say the specific comments you want. Yes. Okay. That was option two summary. Not the trend. Option two, summary. 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 Two, summary. Summary. Specifics. <laughs> I say specifics. Oh. <laughs> Here you go. Mark. Come on, Mark. I, all right. I, I'm going I'm, I'm to give a non answer. I, I don't frankly care too much. <laughs> You know, if, we do the, if we do the specifics, if we do the specifics, for example, the respondents, for, for, in one of the, on, on the enforcement question, there's a respondent. He's the a defendant. He's the only one who responded, and he responded like ten times. That we're going to have those comments to say, we got these comments, but they're from one guy in this one year. Here they are, right? Um, The question. If you would rather see them, not from you, from the, the question. <laughs> government <laughs> side. What's the question? Whoever sat in on behalf of government gave you guidance relative to comments. Correct. Oh, so you're talking about when, during the last teleconference, what they said. Mm -hmm. So they said they didn't take a position one way or the other, but what they did say is that it was not uncommon. In fact, he believed that most of them did give specific comments, okay. but they didn't have an opinion one way or the other okay. which way to go. Okay. All right, have to pick. All right. All right. Um, specific. <laughs> specific. So that's five specifics. Mm -hmm. So option two would then win. Do we need a formal part of the public interested in whether there's a summary or a summary? The public is elsewhere right now. We need CPR for the public. The public is standing their weekend at this point. All right. Next. 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 Your next question. The next question, I don't think we had a final determination on what to do with the board composition part of it. Right, there was some theory that you were gonna work, we might work with council to make it more vague. Right, so would you like us to do that? Or would you like back. to take it out? So yeah. Isn't there an initial yeah. question of whether we want to discuss, include it at okay. all? So there's, right. there's, two, there's two things. One is do you want to take it out and include it up? You don't want to include it at all, that's one. Option two is to make it more vague. So we'll do the same thing. One or two, which is better. One is to keep, wait. One is, one is, one is to, to remove it entirely right. and have right. discussions later, like, you know, more elaborate discussions later. Two is to take out this version and work with council to make it more vague. Yeah. Vague. 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 I abstain. Um, I would remove it. From remove. 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 I'd make it vague. I'd remove it. Vague. Is that five five? So, <laughs> 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 so, yeah. so we have. How can it be tied? So, so what I have. Oh, so what I have is five for vague, four for remove, and one for abstain. So then, 
Five, five, and one. Yeah. Can we, okay. can we have staff drafted, and then if we're going to have a call, vote on what and see what the language looks yeah. like? Yeah. I feel more comfortable with that. I honestly just don't feel like I have enough experience to make a comment <laughs> on this. I, I don't know that we've yeah, talked we about it enough, and so maybe a new version will convince you to take it out. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll do that. Yeah. Okay. But is everybody okay with that? So basically, we'll uh -huh. take up with something in the, in the but board. That's, but that's doing option two. Right, but the board will reserve the option to, yeah. the board will reserve the option to say, well, thanks a lot, Kurt, Jessica, we don't like it at all, right. take it all out. Yeah. Yeah. So we can choose to remove or keep yeah. it. Right. So we'll still, we, it's still there. So you can reserve your, the board reserves this uh, jurisdiction to, to, take, right to take it all the way out or to, to, uh, keep the new to render a decision on, on my you will Smith prepare like some vague terminology for us to decide yay or nay. Right over to the Smithsonian, <laughs> yes. <coughs> okay. I think the fourth issue was mooted out because whether well, they have a meeting or not, because I think the board's already asked, we're answered that question that we're going to have some sort of meeting. And now we have closed session. All right. So, read the report from page one. No. You can. <laughs> by yourself. Then another first version, though. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we're let me just take this last topic here, the future agenda items. Um, so you guys can leave. Unless you want to stay for the future. No, I know, but I want to just take the future oh, agenda items so they can go if they wish to leave. Um, somebody should be able to escape. So um, <laughs> it can't be me. Um, any future agenda items? Mark has the one. No. Uh, Dr. Tobin. Dr. Turetsky. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, no. Really? No. Dr. McIntyre? No. Ruby? No. Okay. Mark. No. Wait, sorry, because Mark, you, Mark, you have recommended that oh, yeah. we, yeah. Yeah. we look at the pre-accusation settlements. Oh, yeah. Yes. So you want to include that on a future agenda? Yes. Uh, I'd like the uh, identification of the statute that precludes us from future agenda items. Great. I mean future. <laughs> we got it. Please settle here. All right. We also have the Breeze Arbo. And you would also like the Breeze Arbo issue to come back? Correct. With OE Tracker? Yes. 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 When are we going to do the, it, the evaluation of the EO officer? January. January. Yeah. And then can we take stuff off? Like, for instance, delete the strategic plan and the sunset report and the dispensing optician committee appointments since they're actually already in the, they've been agendized. So at least we can knock some stuff off of the future agenda items. So we can, but just know that just taking it off does not mean it's not going to come back because they're rolling topics. And so for January 26th, for example, that whole day is going to be the strategic plan. And then at a future meeting, the board's going to have to adopt the strategic plan. Same thing with sunset report for a future agenda item. In order to discuss it, it has to be agendized. So we can take it off with the understanding that it's a rolling topic and we'll be there. No, I, mean, I, don't, I just like being able to show that we actually That's cross some stuff off the, off the list. So. <laughs> So the public is left. There is no public comment. And that's turned off. Okay, closed session. Yeah, so we're going to go into closed